Good morning. We are so delighted that we're able to be here together today for our second annual Transforming Justice Conversation. We'd like to begin this morning with a word of welcome from the president of Chestnut Hill College, Sister Carol Jean Vale. Sister Carol. Good morning. It's a pleasure to welcome you to Chestnut Hill College's second Transforming Justice Conference, Systems Change and Our Interconnectedness. Special thanks to the co-collaborators who have made this conference possible. Atif Bostic, Executive Director of Uplist Solutions, Sister Catherine Nerney, Director of the College's Institute for Forgiveness and Reconciliation, Dr. Lauren Barrow, Center Chair for Education, Advocacy and Social Justice, Attorney Kathy Smith, and faculty member, Dr. Patricia Way. We are grateful for your ongoing work and for the organization of this event today. While we would certainly prefer to meet in person, I am pleased that technology permits us to gather despite the constraints that keep us apart physically. I believe no one here would disagree that we have a desperate need in our country for deep, authentic forgiveness and healing. Over these past four or five years, I have grown increasingly horrified by the blatant racism, raging white supremacy, and unapologetic bigotry on display in various parts of the United States. As I observed these behaviors, I started to feel as if I had been living in a bubble, removed from the intensity of the volatile emotional reactions of many of our countrymen and women. I was never naive enough to believe that racism and the other isms had been eradicated, but I did not realize how widespread these negative attitudes were until permission was given to put aside polite civil discourse and express unabashedly how one really felt. Listening to the vitriol and hate, I felt as if I were a victim of shell shock. This cannot continue. This is not all right. This is not what freedom looks like. After the death of George Floyd, many of us listened to the stories of our colleagues of color as they shared their experiences of life in the United States. They told us how tired they are of talking about the treatment they experience and of trying to change their reality by speaking the cold truth about repeated experiences of prejudice, of mistreatment by some police officers, of the murders of black women and men by law enforcement personnel, by almost certain incarceration if apprehended for a crime, whether guilty or not. More than once, both from colleagues and students, I have been told, I can't help you white people anymore. You have to figure it out yourselves. I'm tired. I can't go on. I could go on and on with the list of things in our nation that are breaking our hearts. That the list is so long is tragic in itself. However, the people who gather in this virtual room today are those who desire to make a difference in our culture, to change the conversation, to bind and heal the wounds of brutality and injustice. Each of us and all of us have to be part of the solution. Lady Justice needs to remove her blindfold and look hard with both eyes at what passes for equal treatment under the law. She needs to see clearly all of the victims seated on both sides of the courtroom, not just one side. Blind justice was never blind. It is time for our legal and prison systems to reevaluate their broken structures. Our local and state governments must discover pathways to provide the funds necessary for all of our children, urban and suburban, 
to benefit from a first-class education, and in the process, examine and own their role in fueling the school to prison pipeline. There is much work to be done, work that requires good and generous hearts, determined to master the lessons the past has taught us and to labor with determination to affect change in the present and continue those efforts well into the future. In memory of the great John Lewis, let us commit ourselves to making good trouble, the kind of trouble that brings about forgiveness, reconciliation, and healing, first in our own hearts, and then in the hearts and spirits of each person we meet along the way. I close with the words of John Lewis, quote, within all of us, there is the spark of the divine that helps us and moves us. This force is part of our DNA. Maybe it's planted by God Almighty, and we have to use it for good, to be the best we can be. We've come too far. We've made too much progress as a people to stand still or slip back. We can help create the beloved community. We can help redeem the soul of America and lift America, lift our country, lift our people to higher heights, end quote. May it be so. Thank you and welcome. Sister Carol, thank you for those inspiring words of welcome. And surely today we do want to be part of the solution, part of the healing and part of the transformation that we so desperately need. And now Sister Kathy Nerney, the director of Chestnut Hill College's Institute for Forgiveness and Reconciliation will offer her opening remarks. Sister Kathy. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to uh, join with uh, Sister Carol in thanking all the people who have really helped to make this conference possible. And to that list that Sister Carol uh, shared with us, I'd like to add Sister Michelle Lesher, whom you've already seen and heard, who is our moderator for today's conference. And behind the scenes, Don Vischer, who is our technical producer. So along with them, I want to say on this National Kindness Day that I am so fortunate to work with such amazing and generous colleagues. So I want to thank them very specially as we begin this second annual Transforming Justice Conference. And now to each of you. On this Friday, the 13th day of November, in this unforgettable year 2020, we come together not bound by a paralyzing wall of fear, but with an audacious outpouring of hope. With this collective energy, we strive toward a future where the worth and dignity of every person is respected and upheld. It is an honor to join with you today as we pledge ourselves to help heal the wounds of a nation crying out for just mercy and transforming love. In this post-election week, we have reason to hope that a new beginning is possible despite the troubles that continue to besiege us. My name is Kathy Nerney. I'm a sister of St. Joseph, a professor in our religious studies department of Chestnut Hill College, where I serve as the director of our college's Institute for Forgiveness and Reconciliation. And since its inception 12 years ago, our college community has worked passionately to deepen and expand its commitment as a Catholic institution of higher learning to educate, advocate, and work together far beyond our college campus for a society where hatred and violence will not have the last word, but where the journey to forgive and reconcile will pave the way for healing and wholeness. 
we pledge to work with others throughout our country and our world to help restore and rebuild the humanity of every person and the one human family we are meant to be as imperfect but beloved sisters and brothers. There is another way, an alternative to divisions and condemnation, and together we seek to make this our common future. As Gandhi reminded us, and I quote, forgiveness is not for the weak. Forgiveness is an attribute of the strong, end quote. As director of our institute, I have had the privilege to meet and work with some of the most courageous and inspiring people from various countries, ethnic and racial backgrounds, with diverse religious and social identities, from politicians to police officers, from faith leaders to human rights advocates, from victims of violent crimes, to those who have taken responsibility for committing them. Those many different groups and individuals have strengthened my conviction that we share a common humanity and our true work in life is to live out the oneness that we already are. That shared vision of a world at one incites and propels us, but it also demands perseverance and courage to bring that vision to reality. For that work of transforming justice, we come together today. I've been inspired of late by the portrait of a young six-year-old little black girl, Ruby Bridges, who 60 years ago tomorrow, November 14, 1960, dared to walk through the dark halls of exclusion and segre segregation into a shadowy light which grew brighter because of her courage to risk a new beginning in the uncharted territory of an all white Louisiana elementary school. We remember too her mother, Lucille, who companioned her daughter and who died on Tuesday at the age of 86. Little Ruby's long walk to inclusion and equality continues in our day with more light dawning as women and particularly women of color step into new positions of leadership, standing on the shoulders of those who went before them to, to quote our new pres vice president elect, Kamala Harris. One of those women I would like to raise up this morning is Ella Baker, who spent decades of her life working in our civil rights movement right up until her death on December 13, 1986. I'm struck by a quote of Ella's that I think resounds with a message we will take away as we listen to one another today. Ella claimed this. And I quote, in order for us as poor and oppressed people to become part of a society that is meaningful, the system under which we now exist has to be radically changed. This means that we are going to have to learn to think in radical terms. I use the term radical in its original meaning getting down to and understanding its root cause. It means facing a system that does not lend itself to your needs and devising means by which you can change that system. Ella dedicated her life to the next generation. She saw the big picture and realized that human freedom was a goal that would take generations to bring to fruition. Her commitment to the young resonates with our work today as juvenile justice takes center stage in our struggle to transform systems of injustice that far too often imprison young people in a past they cannot change 
but who have all they need to become their truest selves with a little help from the kind of equal justice and equal opportunity that lifts them up to see and become who they can be, not just for their own sakes, but for the world that needs the gifts they have to bring us. So we are here today because we realize that if we are to form a more perfect union, we must radically change systems which perpetuate people who are poor, young people who do not have a fair chance to grow to their full potential, racial injustice that ex excludes some of us because of the color of our skin, while it raises up others to think themselves superior. May we live the conviction that until all are free, none of us is free. Until all are fed and housed and employed, the unmet needs of others diminish us all. We have work to do, but we are stronger and better because you are here today. Welcome to our second annual Transforming Justice Conference. Yes, I look forward to sharing this day with you as we engage the issues of systems change that we may acknowledge and live our interconnectedness. Thank you for being here today. Thank you, Sister Kathy, for reminding us that we are already one and that we have work to do and that we must use our gifts and our talents to transform these systems. And now Atif Bostic, who is co-hosting this, our second annual justice conference, along with Chesnan Hill College, will share his opening remarks as the executive director of Uplift Solutions. Atif. Thank you, Michelle, uh, for uh, your introduction. And then thank you, uh, President Vail, uh, for your um, heartfelt, warm remarks uh, this morning. Uh, it's no more true than what you said. And then uh, Sister Kathy Nerny uh, as well. Your remarks this morning um, really touched uh, where we are as a society, what we need to do, the challenges we face, uh, and the things uh, that we can, we can do to make this a more just society. Good morning, all. My name is Atif Bostic, and I am Executive Director of Uplift Solutions and one of the co-founders of the Transforming Justice Conference, as you just heard. At Uplift Solutions, we work to address the many needs of our most vulnerable citizens, particularly the formerly incarcerated. In my role as an executive director, I've had the opportunity to imagine and create programs that address systemic issues within our society. I've had the opportunity to see firsthand some of those issues as I work with and alongside individuals impacted by our system. And with that, I and we are committed to addressing, addressing those systems that keep us from having a just society. I'm extremely excited to be with each of you this morning and in our second year of this conference. While we're not able to be together physically, I feel we're more connected than we've ever been before. Since last year's conference, we faced a global pandemic, civil unrest, and a divided country, yet we continue to forge ahead. We continue to make progress in the direction of good. As Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. To take, today we take another step toward justice with the Transforming Justice Conference. In a few moments, you'll begin to hear from some dynamic leaders and doers. In listening to these amazing speakers assembled for this conference, whom I would like to thank for joining us and giving of themselves unconditionally. I challenge you to think of new ways to get connected, new ways to have greater impact, new ways to move us toward a more just society. Once you've thought of these ways, then commit to working tirelessly to make them a reality. To that end, I would be remiss if I didn't thank my fellow co-host uh, with this conference, a fellow, a fellow um, founders of this conference, Sister Kathy Nerney and Dr. Lauren Barrow for their tireless work on making this a reality. 
I would like to also thank Dr. Patricia Way and Kathy Smith Esquire, who joined us in our second year and have played a pivotal role in moving this conference virtual. While I would normally say, sit back, relax, and enjoy, I'm gonna ask you to sit up, be engaged, and take action. Welcome to the Transforming Justice Conference. Thank you, Atif, for reminding us of our connectedness and the progress for good that has happened even despite the difficulties that we are certainly facing in our society, and for the reminder to sit up and be active. As a way to connect us back into the wonderful spirit and energy of last year's conference and to ground us in the work that is ours today, we'll now see a short video clip. Some of the things that we still do in our system is that we allow people to come in and then we make them more desperate. Your life can be ruined. These are high stakes decisions. You can lose your apartment. These are not just decisions we should be taking lightly. And this is all before you even get into a courtroom. Pennsylvania is the only state that does not fund public defense. It is mounted on the counties. And so as a result, depending on where you are when you're poor and accused, depends on what type of justice you'll be able to access. If we're not careful about what we're doing, we're gonna create a whole class of citizens that cannot contribute to our communities. At some point, enough has to be enough, and we need to stop wasting taxpayer dollars by keeping people in prison who are no longer posing any sort of danger to any of us. In keeping with this grounding work, we have invited one of our distinguished presenters and attendees of last year's Transforming Justice Conference, Representative Chris Rabb, to offer a recap of that first conference. Representative Rabb, who was chosen to represent the 200th legislative district in 2017, will also share some of the relevant events that have happened over the past year to set a context for our conference today. Welcome, Representative Rabb. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Rep. Rabb, and I'm your friendly neighborhood state representative here in Mount Airy. And uh, for all of you who don't know me or this legislative district, I represent 65,000 souls in Chestnut Hill, Mount Airy, and parts of West Oak Lane. I was elected in 2016 and recently re-elected. Um, and I'm really glad to be back because uh, this conference last year was very meaningful generally, but particularly meaningful to me because I met people who I otherwise would not have met and engaged with to inform meaningful and substantive um, policy. Um, and it was a truly um, wonderful experience for myself and my staff. And I'm very appreciative to all involved and I'm happy to be back um, I know I don't have a lot of time um, on your uh, uh, packed schedule, um, so I want to get to it. Uh, I'm going to give you an overview of things that have happened since last year. And as you all know, it's been quite a lot. Um, in the aftermath of the killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and others, people took to the streets. People expressed their First Amendment rights uh, all over Philadelphia, all over the Commonwealth, all over the nation, and all over the world. And that had a real influence on me and a number of my colleagues in the Pennsylvania House of Representatives, so much so that we were inspired to commandeer the House floor and demand justice and immediate legislative action around police accountability. There had never been any legislation that has passed or been enacted into law that actually dealt with police violence and police accountability. It never happened. But in 36 days, we, were, we went from shutting down the House floor so that we could not have session, legislative session, to enacting um, into state law bills that had been stymied for months or for years in the Judiciary Committee on which I serve. Now, that's a huge feat. This is one of the oldest legislative bodies in the world. 
Benjamin Franklin was one of our, actually the first Speaker of the House. So in this long storied history of this legislative body, nothing had ever been done to address these issues. And like I said, within just 40 days, we're able to enact meaningful state laws. Um, so I just wanna go over some of those things that have happened um, and talk about some of those bills very quickly. Uh, Senate Bill 637 provides alternatives to licensing boards in Pennsylvania to issue licenses to formerly incarcerated and convicted individuals. Um, there are a lot of barriers that have been talked about and referenced in the video and by other folks um, that made it hard for returning citizens to be reintegrated into society. So some of those barriers have been dissolving through legislation. Um, House Bill 440 eliminates fines and fees as a barrier to criminal records uh, record sealing, as well as allowing for criminal record sealing for those who are fully acquitted. With regard to probation reform, House Bill 1555 uh, reforms Pennsylvania's antiquated probation system to remove barriers and make the system more about rehabilitation than retribution. House Bill 2040 cre uh, would create Pennsylvania's Second Chance Job Act, a publicly accessible online job posting website where employers who are willing to hire formerly incarcerated individuals can submit job postings. This was a bill that was voted unanimously out of the Judiciary Committee uh, on December 9th of 2019. And like 1555, it was placed on the calendar um, several times, but has yet to be brought up for a vote. So there's a lot of legislative action that is happening. We still have to get this um, enacted into law. And obviously this is where you all come in for your advocacy. They will listen to you, but we have to be loud, we have to be proud, and we have to be organized. Uh, House Resolution 634 would create the Pennsylvania Task Force on Technical Probation Violations to review how Pennsylvania handles technical probation violations and creates a report with recommendations to improve procedures governing technical violations. Again, also voted unanimously out of the Judiciary Committee but it was placed on the calendar, but never brought up for a vote. We have a new legislative term to start starting December 1st, and we're gonna need your help to advocate for bills such as these. Um, a bill I'm particularly close to that was modeled off of a separate piece of legislation I introduced um, over two years ago is House Bill 1841. This has been enacted into law. It creates a police misconduct database so that uh, any law enforcement officer, not just municipal police, they could be sheriffs, constables, um, any law enforcement um, agent uh, up and down and across the Commonwealth um, who leaves one position and maybe gets into some trouble and tries to get a job in another law enforcement agency in Pennsylvania or anywhere in the country, their personnel records are put into a confidential database so that any law enforcement employer has access to see if they're going to be an asset or a liability. This could save lives. This was inspired in part by Antoine Rose's tragic killing, um, David Jones in Germantown, Tamir Rice in Cincinnati, um, in Cleveland, apologies, um, and others. That is a really important bill that is now state law and was unanimously um, voted out of the House of Representatives and the Senate. These are the things that happen when we organize. These are things that happen when we educate ourselves and we take the time, we take the care, and we get things done by working together. Um, I know I don't have a lot more time, but I also want to mention House Bill 1910 that is also state law. It requires mental health evaluations with a focus on PTSD for law enforcement officers upon request of an officer, a police chief, or within 30 days of a uh, police involved shooting or, or the like. There's so much more we can do, but this is a great start. And it was inspired by people taking to the street.
by expressing their First Amendment rights to, to, to assemble free speech. And um, I'm really proud because we showed out and showed up here in this district, in Chestnut Hill, in Mount Airy, in Germantown, all over the city. We can do this, but we have to do it together and we have to be informed and stay informed and know that everyone has a role. That's what my grandmother used to tell me as a community organizer. Everyone has a role. That includes folks in the religious and faith communities. That includes activists. That includes academics. That includes young people who are not even old enough to vote. That includes folks on the inside who are incarcerated, who are advocating for their own interests inside. Everyone. But we have to do that together. And I am very honored to come back to this conference um, and share the good news and also let you know that we, we in Harrisburg, who truly believe in justice, we need your help. And I'm going to put my information in the chat. And I hope you will follow up with me and I hope you will join me as we move towards meaningful criminal justice reform and meaningful police accountability. Thank you so much. Thank you, Representative Rab, for your great energy and for your willingness to be here with us today. And thanks for making us aware of the necessary and transformative legislative work that's happened this past year. And also for calling us to do the work together and to make our voices heard. We're really, really grateful. At this moment, I'd like to just offer a tech note that if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to use the Q&A at the bottom of the page. So we will have some time to interact later, but we do want you to know that that's there. And so if there's anything that you would like to ask or make known, please use that Q&A um, section at the bottom. And at this point, um, we turn the conference back over to Kathy Nerney, who will introduce our keynote speaker for today. Well, thank you so much, Michelle. Uh, it's my delight to introduce to you now our keynote speaker for this morning, Dr. Liz Theo Harris. And I will not spend her time sharing with you a biographical sketch. That biographical information is available on your program and well worth the read for those of you unfamiliar with her life's work. I would like to say a few words, however, on why Dr. Theo Harris is such an appropriate and invaluable contributor to our goal of transforming justice as we host our second annual conference today. A life of faith and activism has shaped Liz's life since her childhood days growing up in Milwaukee. She credits her mother as the foundation upon which she has built her life and her work. Standing on the shoulders of her mother has provided Dr. Liz Theo Harris a vast and wide perspective from which to see more of the kind of world she would spend her life striving to promote. A world where poverty and racism are overcome and equality and justice reign. I don't know about you, but I often stand in awe of how people come into our lives, not as an accident or by mere coincidence, but as a providential partner we are meant to meet in order to do what we're invited to do next. Thus, Dr. Theo Harris already committed to working with and for people who are poor, met Reverend William Barber, from the Cairo Center, which Dr. Theo Harris founded and directs at Union Theological Seminary in New York, Liz has partnered with Reverend Dr. William Barber to co-chair the Poor People's Campaign, a national movement for the moral revival of our country. As an ordained Presbyterian minister, Reverend Theo Harris has always lived with one primary goal, to connect faith with social justice. The work of the church, the work of human rights advocates and caring people from all walks of life come together on the streets. And as Representative Kit, uh, Chris Rabb just reminded us, this is our hope that people have shown up 
on our streets. And as uh, Liz reminds us, she sees that today, and I quote, there are many faces of religion from organized and institutionalized religion to the religion of the streets and of movements. This vision gives us every reason to assert that today's conference is a sacred event. We believe that working together to end racism, poverty, militarism, the degradation of our planet, and resisting a nationalism that sees the US as exclusionary or superior to other countries is holy work. And to this, we pledge our best united efforts as we welcome Dr. Liz Theo Harris to speak with us about systems change as a moral movement where everybody's in, nobody's out. Liz, we are honored to have you with us today. We are eager to listen and ready to respond. Thank you for all you do for so many and for sharing your time and gifts with us this morning. Dr. Theo Harris. Well, thank you so much. Um, it's a real honor and pleasure to be here with everybody um, today. Thank you so much for the invitation um, and, for, uh, and for pulling on um, this important, important conference um, uh, that is focused on transforming justice. And indeed, we're living in a time, we're living in a place where we must transform. We have to transform our hearts, we have to transform our minds, we have to transform our bodies, and we have to transform this entire society. Um, I wanna start with the words of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, who said years ago, and it's still you know, glaringly true today, that there are two Americas, one small and beautiful, where some have the freedom of plenty and another where many are daily constrained by the harsh realities of poverty, of racism, of food insecurity, of homelessness. As I come before you this morning, there are 140 million poor and low income people living in the United States, 43.5% of the US population from all races, all creeds, all colors, and folks that are living in or one storm, one healthcare crisis, one tornado, one job loss away from deep poverty. In a nation that boasts of being the wealthiest country in the world, more than half of our kids live in homes that don't have enough food. 250,000 people die every year because of poverty, racism, and inequality. In Lowndes County, Alabama, families have raw sewage in their yards, mold in their homes, Children have to use CPAP machines just to breathe. In Oak Flats, Arizona, native grave sites are being desecrated and indigenous families are being pushed out by multinational uh, mining corporations. Grace Harbor, Washington, homeless encampments of millennials are being attacked by the police and by white supremacist militia groups. In Flint, Michigan, and 4 million homes across the United States, including many, many, many in Pennsylvania. Mothers can buy unleaded gas, unleaded paint, but can't provide unleaded water for their children. And did you know that 53 cents of every discretionary dollar that this government spends goes towards military, yet we lose more veterans to suicide than war? And only 15 cents of every discretionary dollar goes to education and health care and anti-poverty programs combined. And this is all happening before the novel coronavirus hit. 
We all are very aware that COVID has spread through the existing fissures of society, fissures of racism and poverty. It has exposed foundations of injustice and disproportionately impacted poor people and black people, Latino people, native and indigenous people. Over the past months, more than 12 million people have lost their employer-based healthcare, adding to the 87 million who had inadequate healthcare in the first place. One in 10 low-income renters across this entire land are likely to face eviction in the next two months. 13 million people reported not having enough food to eat last month. This in a nation that throws away more food than it takes to feed the entire world. But I'm here not just to talk about these problems, but to tell you about a movement that is building to change these problems. Poverty and racism are not divine necessity. They are a human creation Indeed, ending poverty, abolishing racism is poverty, is possible. We can change it. And we want everybody here and everybody you know to join us. From the Bronx to the border, from Appalachia to Aberdeen, Washington, from the deep south to the California coast, it has become clear that people are ready to come together and demand justice. And if we're serious about building such a movement, we must simultaneously address five interlocking injustices. We must start with systemic racism, connect it to systemic poverty, see the connections with ecological devastation, the war economy, and this distorted moral narrative of religious, especially Christian nationalism. We must have a sustained moral movement that engages in a broad fusion of people from all walks of life, a movement that is led by and led with those that are most impacted by poverty and injustice, a movement that engages the nation with moral analysis, with moral articulation and with moral action. If we have a different moral imagination, if we have policy shifts guided by moral fusion, we can choose a better way. We have to say that if those who want to suppress our votes and our wages and cut education and block healthcare and starve our children and elders and define who we can love and increase gun rights and deregulate industry and attack immigrants and attack indigenous people and attack women, if they are cynical enough, if they are mean enough to be together, then our fusion movement has to be hopeful enough, has to be smart enough to get together. In American history, whenever we face the forces of regression, movements have, have arisen to call us to higher ground. That's what abolitionists did in the 19th century, women suffragists did in the early 20th century. That's what happened in the 1950s and the 1960s when Rosa Parks and Bayard Rustin and Ella Baker and Fannie Lou Hamer and many other grassroots moral leaders of every race creed, color, class, and sexuality did when they built the Black freedom movements, the civil rights movement. It's what Martin Luther King and Marion Wright Edelman and the welfare rights mothers and others called us to in the Poor People's Campaign more than 50 years ago, challenging the nation to address racism and poverty and militarism. That's what King was working on before he was shot and murdered. And indeed, as Dr. King said, when he was building the 1967-68 Poor People's Campaign, a true revolution of values will soon cause us to question the fairness and justice of many of our past and present policies. On the one hand, we are called to play the Good Samaritan on life's roadside, but that will only be an initial act. One day, we must come to see that the whole Jericho Road must be transformed so that men and women will not constantly be beaten and robbed as they make their journey on life's highway. True compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It comes to see that an edifice which produces beggars 
needs restructuring. This morning, I want to invite you to join with thousands of people across this country who are part of restructuring an edifice that is producing beggars and billionaires to struggle for a country and a world where everybody is in, nobody is out, to bring about a moral revolution of values. And to do this, we must shift the moral narrative that blames poor people, blames people of color, immigrants, women for poverty and all of society's problems, claims that there is not enough to go around when we're living in beautiful abundance and pits us against each other rather than uniting us in a way to promote peace and justice and love and truth and fullness. Such a movement aims to build the power, build the connection of people from the ground up. And every state, every county, every city, every town where people have come forward to organize. In Alabama, one of more than a dozen states that still has denied Medicaid expansion, moms who have had to bury their daughters because they didn't have health care are leading the movement. In Kentucky, the Poor People's Campaign has fought to stop work requirements being attached to Medicaid and to food stamps. They've defied the governor and state police who refuse to let the people come into the state capitol. But when we organized and came together, we won. In the South, in North Carolina and Mississippi and Alabama and Arkansas, we're seeing black and white and brown people forming new fusion alliances, resisting the intentional tactics of racial division. In Kansas, cattle ranchers and family farmers and undocumented immigrants and fast food workers are coming together across lines that have traditionally divided and joining the movement together. In Missouri, people are winning higher wages and in Georgia and in Florida. And here in Pennsylvania, people across the state are uniting and organizing a new and unsettling force of people ready to do justice, ready to love kindness. We all sense that we're living in a time of crisis, but this is also a Kairos moment. Kairos is a Greek word. It means a time when the rubble of the past breaks down and something new breaks through. I want to share some words from the Kairos documents in South Africa that were written in 1985. These prophetic leaders were challenging the crisis of apartheid and they still apply to our day. The time has come, they wrote. The moment of truth has arrived. We have been plunged into a crisis that is shaking the foundations and there is very, and, and there is every indication that the crisis has only just begun and that it will deepen and become even more threatening in the months to come. For very many, this is the Kairos, the moment of grace and opportunity, the favorable time in which God, the world issues a challenge to decisive action. It is a dangerous time because if this opportunity is missed, allowed to pass by, the loss will be immeasurable. If there ever was a time, a time to mobilize and organize and register and educate people for a movement, a time to keep on pushing, especially after this re recent election, if there ever was a time to unleash the power of poor and low-income people, a time to get into step, a time to imagine big, bold, visionary solutions, a time to prepare for more sickness, more climate chaos, more eviction, more racism, so that we're ready for change to come, a time to demand an end to war, to demand the end of the militarization of our communities and austerity and healthcare cuts and evictions and water shutoffs, a time for truth and fusion and reconstruction and jubilee. That time is now. Indeed, a movement is breaking through in the United States. There's a moral uprising, a new and unsettling force of people who are repairing the breach, who refuse to give up, refuse to settle and surrender to suffering, who are united by morals. Again, 
Poverty is not inevitable. It's systemic sin. All of us have a responsibility to partner with the poor to end poverty once and for all. I want to urge everyone here that these times call for building a movement, that this movement needs to be led by those most impacted by poverty, by racism, by injustice. In the words of Frederick Douglass, those in pain know when their pain is relieved. Those who would be free can strike the first blow. We can indeed end poverty. We can do better. We must do better. There's enough for everyone. All are deserving of our nation's abundance. And this society does need a moral revolution of values. We're gonna to have to depend on the leadership of those that are most impacted by justice for us to be able to get there. Over the course of my life, many people have said that ending poverty, that abolishing racism is just too ambitious that such demands for human rights and human dignity are both politically inconceivable and ridiculously too expensive. But the benefits of investing in life, not death, far outweigh the costs. Child poverty already costs our country at a minimum 700 million to $1 trillion annually. Racist voter suppression in just Florida alone in one year, added up to $385 million in administrative and court costs. Failing to adequately address climate change, failing to create a genuine green economy could in the end wipe out the equivalent of $3.3 trillion from our economy. And endless wars, not to speak of the 800 US military bases scattered across the planet cost hundreds of billions of taxpayer dollars a year without making our country or world any safer. Instead of bankrolling war and the wealthy, Americans could swiftly cut 350 billion from the annual Pentagon budget, use it to enhance genuine security at home and still have a larger military budget than China and Russia and Iran combined. Our government could raise the federal minimum wage like they just did in Florida to a living one and experience a ripple effect that that money circulated back through the economy, both faster and further than the billions Congress has given up in already immensely well, given, given to the already immensely wealthy and corporations through tax cuts. The U.S. could gain $886 billion in estimated annual revenue from fair taxes on that very 1% of Americans, the most powerful corporations and on Wall Street. Can you imagine a society that truly began to invest in public infrastructure, creating ever more and better jobs not related to the military industrial complex while accelerating a clean energy transition that would be good for our country and for the planet? In the process, the United States could provide healthcare, housing, a decent, equitable education for absolutely everyone. We can declare jubilee, the forgiveness of debts, the release of those who are oppressed, paying people a living wage, investing in healthcare and the public good. That word jubilee, it comes from the Hebrew hovel, meaning a, bla a trumpet blast of liberty. And it was said that on the day of liberation, the sound of a ram's horn would ring through the land. Jubilee is a biblical concept that connects covenantal law and shalom justice, alternative power systems and economic rights. And throughout our sacred scriptures and throughout our US constitution, there is a focus on ending exploitation, on caring for the poor, on mandating Sabbath and Jubilee, on prohibiting charging interest for the poor, for the prompt paying of living wages, for equity and legal proceedings, and for social programs that uplift the poor. Now, we have to look at what is possible, what our deepest moral values tell us to be so. It's not that God didn't make enough for everyone to eat, nor that abundance will trickle down from the rich to the rest. 
Our deepest moral values, nowhere in the Bible, nor our U.S. Constitution, does it suggest that anyone should be able to profit off a pandemic, nor that Peter should have to rob Paul to be able to pay our bills. In the New Testament, Jesus does not say, get a job to the homeless of our society, nor you shall not bear children to the refugee mothers in his community. Our deepest moral values don't proclaim that a little charity is as good as you can do, nor that the powerful should be exempt from taxes, but the poor shall have to pay. Our constitution, our moral values, our sacred texts and traditions do not suggest that private insurance companies should be able to pay families of those bruised and battered by legions of empire in order to leave the governing authorities unaccountable. And never once in our Bible, does it suggest to charge lepers a copay or cut people from accessing healthcare in a public health crisis? The problems of 2020 clearly demand a jubilee vision for the nation. And the last few years and months offer evidence that growing segments of society across this country and across this world are willing to imagine bold solutions to poverty, to systemic racism. We're prepared to organize what could be a new reconstruction to make them a reality. I've been engaged in a movement to reconstruct society led by the poor and dispossessed for more than 25 years. And in, many, in that time, many come forward to say that we can't do it, that this is as good as it gets, that the cost of addressing inequality are just simply too great. But this is just simply not true. This is not the way. We as a people, from the hood to the holler, as they say in Kentucky, from the Bronx to the border, as they say in the Bronx, from the California coast to the Carolinas, are readying ourselves to save the heart and soul of our democracy. We're moving forward together and not one step back. And we ask everybody at this conference and everyone in your community around you to join us in transforming this society, transforming justice where everybody is in and nobody is out. Thank you very much. Dr. Theo Harris, thank you so much for those powerful remarks. You both painted the picture of the reality while also reminding us with great energy and hope that with a different moral imagination, this is possible, that we can indeed choose life over death if we do this together. Thank you for reminding us to imagine bold solutions. At this point, we would like to just take a moment and just let everything that Dr. Theo Harris shared just sink in for a moment. And as you sit with the power of her words, of the call and of the energy that it evokes within us, we invite some conversation at this point and again, we're gonna remind you that you may use the question and answer box. So if there is a question that you have, if you pose it, um, then I will offer it back. Or if you have a comment, something that you just would like to explore a little bit further, um, we please feel free to use that box at this moment. So the first uh, comment here is, is it possible to have access to your words after this? Yeah, I, I can share them with the with with the organizers and, and and you can get them out for sure. Wonderful, thank you. I also invite any of the other panelists who might want to offer something, please feel free to jump in here as well. So here is a question. Um, first, a thank you. How can we initiate our involvement? Great, yeah. So, so thanks for that question. Um, so 
uh, I want to talk a little bit about the structure of the Poor People's Campaign, um, because then I think it, it lends itself to how folks can, can get involved. Um, we, we really believe that to build a national movement, it means that we have to nationalize state and local movements. Um, so the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, has state coordinating committees, committees that are made up of uh, poor people who are organizing, moral leaders and clergy, activists, advocates, um, you know, people from many different walks of life across a great diversity of people in about 45 uh, states across the country. In Pennsylvania, there's a very strong poor people's campaign. And, and there are folks that are organizing regionally uh, and, uh, and also on a statewide and, and national basis. Uh, to, to get involved in, in the day-to-day -day work, of the Pennsylvania Poor People's Campaign. Folks can go to uh, poorpeoplescampaign.org, the website um, for our campaign. And you can, you can look at this interactive map. Uh, you can click on Pennsylvania and you can see upcoming events as well as the contact information for folks that are, are organizing across the state. Um, uh, also for, for folks that um, are religiously involved in this work, um, faith leaders, but that doesn't mean um, heads of, of congregations. That, that's anybody that identifies as, as uh, doing this work from a kind of a moral conviction. Uh, we have something called a prophetic council and, and you can sign up um, both for regular updates about the Poor People's Campaign and what we're doing on a, a regular and on a national basis, as well as sign up to, to be a part of, of regular calls, um, the distribution of resources for, for faith and moral leaders um, as a part of this prophetic council. We right now just got through with organizing um, millions and millions of people to, to be active in this um, electoral season. Um, we put out a report this past August that showed that really poor and low income people hold the key to shifting the political calculus in this nation. Um, that, that when poor and low income people vote uh, around an agenda or agenda of healthcare and living wages, of, of ending systemic racism and, and um, you know, the demilitarization of our communities, that when that happens, um, that you can shift uh, both who is elected and um, what policies people put forward. And so uh, we, we did a lot of work reaching out, um, challenging voter suppression, you know, protecting people's votes. And now we're in a season where we're, we're needing to push, push, push um, for bold uh, policy, uh, not for incremental change, not for uh, compromise, um, but for, for what was clearly the mandate of this election. Um, every every congressional representative who ran on a program of, of universal health care won. Um, in Florida uh, and in many other states that had ballot initiatives around living wages or, or fair taxation, those passed. Um, uh, in lots of communities across this country, folks, even in the exit polls, have said that, you know, that health care, that living wages, that um, investing in, in communities are, are the real issues and concerns of people. And so the Poor People's Campaign uh, this past summer put out a policy platform that is framed around Jubilee, uh, a little bit of what I was talking about. Um, and, and so I encourage folks to go actually read that policy platform, um, but then also to get involved in the local struggles that the campaign and other grassroots organizations in communities are, are putting forward. Because again, we have the solutions to the problems before us. Um, what we need is to be able to build up the power and influence of, of people. And so, so I, I, I hope that, that folks do uh, not just get involved in the Poor People's Campaign, though, of course I want that, or, or don't just contact me me at the Cairo Center. Um, of course, I want that as well. But but we need in this moment for many flowers to bloom. We need a lot of organizing and pushing and visionary thinking. Um, and we need a lot of folks that are are indeed interested in transforming justice. And so, um, you know, please be in touch and please, you know, get involved in our work, but also please make sure that the, the work you're already involved in continues to grow um, and, and blossom. 
Thanks, Liz. We do have um, some other questions as well. And um, so one of them is inquiring about the receptivity of the national government. Um, just aware 15 cents seems inadequate to meet the, the needs of so many people. So what would your response be to that? Yeah, so indeed, um, uh, you can you can see, you know, a nation's or even a community's or even a family's, you know, um, values by by our budgets, right? And and when we study the budget of these uh, yet to be United States, um, we we see that the priority is not the the very founding principles that have had to be fought for, but in in this in in our constitution and in our in our, our founding documents and in the, the great reforms that have had to happen to make this a more just society. Um, instead, you see that more than half of, of, of resources go uh, to kind of funding endless wars um, and very little goes to, to actually the kind of needs and demands of, of the majority of people, um, starting with those who are who are poorest and most marginalized, and you know we have a, a saying in our work, and and it's not just a saying; it's based on empirical data and historical and and contemporary kind of analysis, which is that when you lift from the bottom, um, when you organize um, society around the needs of those most vulnerable, I mean this is this is true about our religious traditions, right? Um, what you do to the least of these, you do unto me. But when you when you organize society around the needs of of those who do not have health care, are 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 working you know, um, low wage jobs, um, when you uh, make it so it's it's virtually impossible for people to get a, a quality education unless you go into a lot of debt. Um, uh, that that but when you when you change all of that, and when you when you address those problems, that actually what happens is that that everybody gets lifted up by that, right? By by transfer, you know, bringing, you know, uh, living wages into a community. What happens is that every, you know, businesses flourish, you know, housing flourishes, you know, everything is, is, is stronger and healthier about that society. So it, it helps that individual low wage worker, but it also helps everybody. Right. Um, and so, so it, what that means though, is that we have right now, not a scarcity of resources, but a scarcity of political will. Um, and the only thing you can do in that moment is to, you know, start talking and putting out the solutions and then build up the power to do so, right? So Dr. King has this beautiful quote um, that I, I really love. He says that power for poor people will really meaning, mean having the capacity, the aggressiveness, the assertiveness and togetherness to make the power structures of this nation say yes, when they may be desirous of saying no. So uh, what we saw in this past election um, was that when we pushed, when we insisted that the real issues of our day, the real moral issues, the real justice issues of our day, our living wages and healthcare, um, our immigration reform, on, on police reform, these kinds of things, that actually not just the people respond, but our, our candidates and our uh, elected officials respond, right? So we organized a, a voting power and um, a kind of protection event uh, uh, President-elect Joe Biden came. Uh, we invited uh, uh, both uh, presidential candidates at the time. It was in September. Uh, President-elect Joe Biden came and said that if he was elected, that ending poverty would be his theory of change. And so, so what has to happen now is how do we hold uh, him and other elected officials to it? Right. And, and how do you do that? By by coming together, by mobilizing folks, by by organizing folks and by insisting that that these are the real needs and that they're that we found the resources. It's there. You know, it's in the power of those that have been elected um, to have a totally different budget. Um, uh, you know, it's it's in the power of the president and vice president elect to to offer all kinds of bold and visionary solution, solutions. But, but what we also know from history is that folks don't just do that on their own. They have to be pushed. Um, and, and, and the way you effectively push is by um, building strong movements of a cross diversity of people. Um, and so again, I, I think that, that, that you know, there's all 
kinds of work that has to be done. It can be done in person. It can be done online, you know, um, but it, it's about building up this power and it's about reaching out um, and, and basically creating what I've learned from brothers and sisters at the U.S. Mexico border. Uh, have talked about of having permanently organized communities, communities where we're all in touch with each other enough, we're aware of each other's needs and, and problems and issues. And, and so we're at the ready uh, when either something regressive is pushed forward, a crisis like COVID happens, a storm you know, crashes into our community, um, but we're also ready um, before any of those bad things happen. And, um, and are prepared to push forward what, what everybody needs and what, what actually can lift all of our, our society up. I wonder if uh, this next question might take this, what you were just talking about, Liz, a little bit further, which basically says, I know you mentioned that people facing poverty should get involved. And then you just spoke about politicians and um, legislation. And how do you specifically engage more privileged people to become more deeply involved? Yeah. So, I mean, what we know again from history is that we need people from all walks of life um, and we need those uh, who are willing to come forward, you know, at this time, um, uh, you know, and, and so, uh, so it is true that in, in my study and in our study of history that, um, that it does take the bold and visionary actions of those that are most impacted. You know, um, uh, you know the words of a, a low-wage worker in our, our work from Appalachian, Virginia says, our backs are against the wall and all we can do is push, right? So the idea that people are being compelled and, and we're surely seeing this, you know, across the country right now, um, whether it's through the rent strikes that people are engaging in or low-wage worker walkouts, um, whether it's, you know, some of the moratoriums that have been won because of the bold kind of actions of people saying, you know, I need my utilities, my kids have to be able to, you know, access the internet, you know, just, a, a, um, but, but again, it, you can't do it alone. Um, you can't, it, it, it can't happen just um, amongst some people, uh, uh, you know, movements that are successful have to reach out and, and touch and, and connect people at all, in all levels of society and, um, and from all walks of life. And, and I think that there's, um, I think you can do this in, in, in many ways. I mean, many folk are, are very aware that there is grave injustice happening. We saw this, especially this summer and, and fall, as you know, some of the largest um, and most diverse um, pub, uh, public protests about racism and economic injustice happened, not just in a small, small number of big cities, but in literally thousands of communities across the country, right? And so, so it, it's clear that, um, that many people are aware and not just aware, but also active um, in, in, in you know, addressing these issues. And, and the folks that are coming forward are, are, are from all walks of life. You know, it's folks that are, are being impacted uh, by police brutality, by eviction, you know, directly. Um, but it's also people who who see that an injury to one is an injury to all, or um, or that that they um, can't be silent in the face of grave injustice, even if uh, it's not happening currently to them or someone in their family. And so, I think you you have to kind of work from from where where people are. I mean. Uh, you know, when folks come forward, uh, then being able to give um, this option, this opportunity to, to get involved. Um, and again, that isn't just the work that the Poor People's Campaign is doing. That's the, the heroic work that so many nonprofits, that so many, um, you know, uh, local kind of uh, organizing campaigns are, are involved in. And so, um, you know, I, but I, but I think it, it, does start with, with those who are compelled to move. And, and what I have found in my experience is that when that happens, then other people come forward. Uh, one, one more example, and, and then we can keep on talking. But, um, you know, when Dr. King had uh, proposed a poor people's campaign, um, and then when he was basically assassinated before it was able to come to, to fruition, um, you know, 
he wasn't able to actually reach out to lots of different aspects of society. Um, uh, you know, at the time, because he had come out against the Vietnam War, because he was suggesting, you know, uniting poor white people and poor black people and poor Latino people um, from across different geographies, it was a pretty controversial position. Um, and so many organizations, many news agencies had had come out against, um, including that that many people of faith weren't even really on board. Um, there were very few, if any, um, national religious kind of denominations. Uh, the Friends were in the mix. Um, uh, uh, the United Church of Christ was was kind of in the mix. Um, but, but even Dr. King's own um, kind of denomination, um, you know, uh, what, kind of shied away from, from really being, you know, there at the center. Um, that, that is different today. Um, that's not just different with the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, though it, it is, you know, we have hundreds of organizations. Um, we have, you know, 20 of the largest national faith bodies um, from different religious traditions, but representing millions of people. You know, we have about 12 of the largest labor unions in the country, again, representing millions and millions of people. Um, and, and those folks haven't just come forward um, you know, both in our work and in other justice work that's happening across the country, uh, you know, just to sign their name or to add their, um, you know, endorsement. But but because people in all different positions, including very influential pastors and preachers and religious organizations that have people from all walks of life and all political beliefs and all positions of power in their very congregations, um, coming forward and saying, you know, that this, you know, our faith traditions say that, that we're supposed to do justice. And, um, and that's not what's happening right now. And, and I think there is this opening and, and therefore we have to kind of walk through that door and, and welcome people, you know, into a broad, into a broad movement um, and not have to agree with absolutely everything everyone else is saying, but, but to unite around a common agenda um, that, that, that is non-negotiable. Things like equal protection under the law, uh, things like everybody in, nobody out, things like when we lift from the bottom, everybody rises. And, and again, these are our basic principles that I think, you know, folks with more, um, with more resources, more political power, and folks um, who are, are compelled uh, because our backs are against the wall and all we can do is push can unite around. That's a really helpful um, vantage point, like a different view. It really gives the impression of like these circles that are widening, widening, widening. So thank you for that. Um, another question here um, is about the anticipated impact post COVID given the crisis that already existed pre COVID. Yeah, so I, I really appreciate, I mean, I appreciate all of these questions, um, but I think we do actually have to kind of take into stock or to account um, the, the so, so the crises that existed before COVID. Um, I mean, when you live in a society um, that has almost half of its people um, one healthcare crisis, one job loss, um, one uh, fire uh, away um, from, you know, absolute destitution. Um, and then you add into that um, a pandemic and historic job loss and historic climate chaos um, in, um, when we see actually what's already happened, um, you know, uh, because of really the lack of getting COVID under control and also the lack of a, a basic infrastructure, despite us being, you know, such a wealthy advanced nation. Um, the fact that, that uh, um, you know, the, this virus could spread on these fissures, like could, could, could really be deepened and, and impacting of uh, you know, we, we, we saw at the beginning of, of this pandemic, and we're continuing to see it, that if, if one person in your community doesn't have health care, or if one person doesn't have a place to shelter and place in, or if um, you don't have kind of national leadership, you know, you know, putting forth that science is real, um, that, that what, what that does is it puts everybody at risk, right? It, it isn't that like, this is a problem that you can just kind of sweep under the rug because, 
you know, someone else's lack of health care doesn't impact you. It, it does. Um, and we're seeing that now. And so then we've gotten to really epic proportions, both with the lack of, um, with, the, with the growth of this virus um, and the economic impact um, in an economy that was already um, having some trouble. Uh, and so I, I, we don't really even know, I think, how to, to be prepared. Um, you know, if, if when the eviction moratoriums um, uh, let up, and even, even if they're extended, um, you know, they're just moratoriums on eviction. It, they're not rent cancellations. Um, and if, if when the utilities and water moratoriums let up, and again, even if they're extended, they're, they're not utility payment cancellations. They're, they're just the extension of, of, of how, how long it's going to be until basically uh, the, the lenders come to, to, to take the, the money that they, people haven't been able to pay, right? The, the job loss, you know, we live in an economy that needs to be adding jobs every month. Um, and what we have right now is subtracting jobs every month. And even when some more jobs are open, you know, we're, what we're seeing is that people that were, um, that got unemployment for the first, you know, three months or then six months of this crisis, they're timing off. Um, and, and, they're, and, and yesterday, I don't know if folks saw, but um, Jerome Powell put out that basically that the economy is not going to go back to what it was. Um, you have the the people in, in in the positions of 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 real power and knowledge saying, you know, what's going to happen is that there's going to be more automation, there's going to be more kind of this distance stuff, and and the the increases are going to be these essential jobs where uh, essential workers are paid expendable wages and given expendable protections, right? And so, so I think we have to be looking at other moments when there have been major economic and social dislocations in this country. Um, and, and, you know, of course there, there's been much talk about the twenties and thirties um, because there's, there's some similarities, you know, uh, and, and what we also saw uh, that happened there was that these huge shanty towns, this, this huge, you know, protests, unemployed councils organizing, um, and, and, and they were able to win some very effective reforms, and they were also able to reify some of the inequ inequities that existed in that, in that society as well, um, where, you know, uh, the Social Security, you know, Act was, you know, and, and some of the labor um, rights uh, weren't extended to, to sharecroppers, weren't extended to domestic workers, weren't, you know. Um, so, so anyways, I think it means that we have to look um, at historical examples, but we have to then be ready with really bold change. Um, that, that, and, and, and that is, again, not just to help the, the millions of people who are, are most impacted by this, but so that our society can indeed actually, um, you know, be a kind of secure, safe, healthy place for, for everybody. Um, and, and, and so I, I think, you know, what that means on a local level is, is being very aware of, of the tremendous need um, but then the need to both meet those needs and then to advocate for larger changes, because, again, with the with the levels and numbers of people that are impacted already and with what looks like is going to keep on happening in this very long, uh, cold winter, um, whether the temperatures are cold or not, um, is is like it's not going to be enough to just have you know, programs on a very local level. Um, we're gonna have to have, you know, a, a tremendous investment, um, an investment that is possible and that will benefit society, um, including business, um, to, to be made, to be able to actually kind of weather this, this storm and prepare for, for future um, viruses, storms, and other kind of crises. And with all of that as a backdrop, everything that, that you've already shared, um, just another question that says, are there some new different parts of the movement that you see as especially significant at this time? Um, the question asker says, I'm thinking of marches and demonstration, but what is it that you find most hopeful right now? Yeah, I mean, so I, I think 
it's really important for us to look for where to find hope in hard times. Um, and I think you often find it not where you're expecting to. Um, uh, you know, for, for, for many, many years, I mean, for decades of my own life, you know, I, I spend my time amongst the folks um, who are most vulnerable and most marginalized in our society. Um, and, and it indeed is always where I find hope and where I find um, kind of what my faith is, you know, as a Christian pastor. Um, and so, you know, there's just amazing leaders the real kind of heroes and heroines of our society that do not make it onto the news, that, that do not get talked about. You know, again, moms who've had to bury their kids or, or fathers who are working three jobs just to, you know, still have their families living in a van. Um, uh, you know, folks that, that uh, you know, are, are being separated from their families um, because of unjust immigration or are having, you know, their water turned off and therefore their kids taken away from them. Um, but who are standing up and saying, not only this, this isn't right and shouldn't happen to me, but, but willing to, to be a part of, of something um, that is bigger than any one of us. Um, and, and, you know, I see this just very regularly. I mean, the Poor People's Campaign is organizing a series of caravans for, for next Monday, the 23rd, not, not this Monday, but the one after. Um, we, we held caravans, you know, a, a couple of weeks ago and, you know, in just dozens of cities, um, people of social distancing, but, you know, are just out there and it's across race, it's across geography, it's across all these things that we're still hearing even in the aftermath of this election aren't possible except for, but except for they're happening, right? Um, you know, poor white people from the mountains of Kentucky and, and, and uh, poor, you know, uh, people of color from, from the Mississippi Delta are actually finding common cause and, and coming together and, um, and not allowing for, you know, loss and death and violence to have the last word. And, and to me, that is extremely hopeful. Um, and it, it's not a hope that says that everything's okay. It's not a hope that, that, that denies the kind of pain and mourning. Um, but it's a hope that, you know, kind of rises from the ashes. Um, it, it's a hope that, that says, even though only bad things have happened, I believe that some good can come. And, and, and to me, that is, that is beautiful. And it's, it's so much more real. Um, and so, you know, I just think all of these kind of heroes out there um, in our nation and, and, and encourage people to get involved if you're not already involved or, or if you are involved to, to then connect with more people that are like you and different from you, because then it, it just, it becomes, you know, really invigorating, really exciting, really something to, to, to hold on to in these times um, when we feel isolated, when we, when we have, you know, when, when many of us will, will show up at Thanksgiving tables and either not be able to be with family or we'll have, you know, empty seats um, because of, of the loss to, to realize that, that we are not alone and, and something else is possible and that there are people all over that wake up every day saying, I'm going to change this society for the better. And, and, and we can do it. That's a great reminder um, to that. Hope is, it's always rooted in reality, you know, and that the idea of we need to reach out to people who think like us and do the work together. And also people who don't, that's really um, so wise and powerful. One other question. Um, could you comment on where you think we are in Philadelphia as a city and how we might work to move the needle forward? Yeah. So um, I lived in Philly for a lot of years. I now have lived in New York for, for um, about 20. So, um, but, you know, I think city, I think Philly is, is, is a city that has, you know, really unbelievable potential. Um, you know, there's a long history of really forward thinking justice work. Um, and that is across the city. And again, all kinds of communities where, um, where it might not be where you're, you're expecting for hope to come from. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a city that has a lot of poverty and a lot of, of racism. Um, uh, it's, it's the largest city 
like it's the poorest large city in in our nation, right? But but again, coming coming out of that um, is is this this what this idea that I was just talking to, which is that that therefore you have the most power and potential to to change things. Um, and I think there's some you know powerful progressive leadership um, in the city um, that's doing really good work, and I and I. And, and there's great grassroots organizing um, in Philly and across the state um, and, and people that see that actually um, to, to have lives improved in Philly, it means, you know, making coalition with people all across the state. Um, so, I mean, I, I really feel like, you know, you have a history of, um, you know, if you go down to that Liberty Bell, uh, you know, you have you have uh, um, this quote from Leviticus of like proclaim justice throughout the land. Right. And and that became the rallying cry of Frederick Douglass and the abolitionists. Right. And that became the model for the reconstructionists. And that became, you know, at the the heart of the black freedom movement. Um, And that became, you know, the, the, you know, that was spread throughout all kinds of movements for justice over the past decades. Um, and then you have, you know, just this, this long and deep history um, and uh, of, of folks, you know, coming forward with, with real solutions. And so I think, uh, you know, there's, there is potential um, in Philly and, and much of that potential is being realized, but, you know, until everybody is in, and nobody is out until we actually have of justice. Um, you know, people people need to keep up um, pe- keep up the the struggle. And 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 you know, I feel encouraged that so many folk um, that I know um, and all of you gathered here are are doing just that. Thank you for that. And uh, related to the topic today, what would you say about youth voices organizing youth justice? Yeah. So. Um, so we, so young people, um, not separate from the rest of the movement, but but young people are where the change happens. Um, not not in the future, um, but in the present, right? Um, uh, and 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 that's just documented, right? And and throughout different uh, movements and throughout history. We regularly have people saying, like, well, what about the young people? Like, what about this generation? Are they going to get involved? And and it always is. It always is um, young folk who who see um, the times that they're living in. You know, who are graduating into crises. Who are who are you know seeing that like uh, you know in many Philly schools, it's still more likely that you'll end up in prison than graduate. Um, I mean, just you know, like the, the harsh realities of, of, of racism and of poverty in our society, um, you know, is, is, is incredibly clear in the, the eyes and in the realities of, of young people. But um, what we also are seeing is just that, that folks from a very young age are, are turning out and, and organizing and again, are, are leading the way, not just uh, for themselves, but for our whole society. And, and, and we have a lot um, that, and the, and and there's a lot of change needed and and what you know is as people are organizing that that you know you you can't you can't stop organizing until you win it all and so um kind of thank goodness for for some of that powerful work and and for youth leadership that that is is rising up um in in our communities today that's great and another um attendee notes, I took notice of what you said about how in this country there is an abundant influence of Christian nationalism, and I agree. How do we advocate for and win back our religious freedoms in this country? Our constitutional and First Amendment right are discarded and perverted by Christian dominance. How do we stop the condemnation of people of different religions and cultures and practices um, from influencing the policies that strip people of their rights? Yeah, so it's a it's a really big, um, it's a really big question, and it it connects to a you know a lot of, of of uh, of the present, um, and and you know as a as a Christian pastor, 
and as a biblical scholar, um, much of my work is actually exactly about about that. Um, I, you know, throughout throughout history, um, there's always been a kind of battle of theologies that takes place that is connected to the the significant movements for change that are happening in society. So, you know, in in again abolition and in 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 um, you know, slaveholders, uh, you know, created a Bible that said, um, slaves obey your masters, um, that, uh, that cut, um, out any references in the Bible to the Exodus or to the prophets or, or Jesus, you know, proclaiming good news to the poor. Um, but, but on the other side, um, the abolitionists, you know, there was Harriet Moses Tubman. There was, um, all of the different kind of leaders who, you know, for whatever quarrel they had with religion and, and even with God, um, didn't cede that, um, didn't let the slaveholder religion be the only kind of religion, only Christianity of, of the time. Um, and then, so I think it's really important in this interreligious, um, multi-faith uh, uh, world um, where we still have and, and in fact, in many places, it's stronger than it ever has been, um, a, a kind of a Christian nationalism, which is, uh, you know, not just impacting, um, you know, those that are kind of in Christian nationalist circles, but, but has become really the kind of dominant theology of our time. Um, and that does put out, you know, uh, you know, submission to authorities, the inferiority of, of other religions and races and ethnicities of people. I mean, some really, really hurtful um, and powerful uh, kind of uh, thinking and belief and, and then also practice um, that, that it, it doesn't get to have the last word. Um, for, for too long, um, many kind of more progressive um, uh, faith leaders um, have kind of uh, ceded the territory um, to these Christian nationalists, um, and and then and in our society and our media has been very complicit in this. You know, there actually is a long tradition, and Philly knows this well. Um, with the with the founding of the AME Zion Church, like with with many different movements, um, with the you know abolitionist history of the um, Friends. Um, again, there's 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 a lot of examples. In, in Philly history of, of kind of uh, religious leadership and um, being on the side of justice. Um, but, but still what you hear as the religious voices of our moment are, are ones that, that say the real issues or the only issues are prayer in schools and hating other people's religion and that Jesus was a card carrying member of the NRA and, and a bunch of things that, that, I mean, both are not biblically true. Um, but also, um, uh, so they're misinterpreted, um, but then also just, you know, leave out the vast majority of what is that the kind of what we would call the moral center of our, of our faith traditions, including of Christianity. And so, you know, I think it really is on, um, on people of faith um, to, to return to the kind of moral center, um, to, to actually you know, turn to the 2000 to 2500 texts in, in the Christian Bible and the Hebrew scriptures and the Christian Testament that, that are all about justice, a justice for the poor and for the widow and for the orphan and for the youth. Um, and, uh, and, and remind um, our larger society that, that again, that this is, this is what, you know, is, is here. Um, and this is the message. Um, and, and, and to not allow um, for, for, you know, as, as Reverend Barber, the co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign will, will often say for, for kind of Christian nationalist leaders to pray P-R-A-Y um, over politicians and political leaders that pray P-R-E-Y on, on the poor and on Muslims and on immigrants and on, on uh, uh, you know, the whole diversity of, of God's children in this world. And so um, I think part of it is actually engaging um, in the kind of theological um, and biblical kind of 
foundations of justice um, and, and really building up um, a, a, a different vision, um, you know, a vision of, of an interreligious, uh, multi-generational, uh, uh, you know, uh, multi-racial uh, um, kind of, uh, you know, freedom uh, gathering of, of everybody, um, of goodwill um, and, and conscience. On a similar note, but moving from religion to schools and thinking about how do we broaden the picture, in terms of curriculum, uh, one of our attendees would love to know what you think about how social studies curriculum can be pried out of the hands of white history chroniclers to include a true multicultural view of how we have come to be where we are. As you probably have heard, like much of my references are to history, right, and to other uh, kind of topics that would fall well within kind of what we understand. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know if high schoolers, but I have a middle schooler and an elementary school um, that fall into what is, um, uh, is, is social studies. And, and I think that, that this is a, a really important um, part of, of the work that we need to do. I will. Um, All right. Bye-bye. Um, uh, so, so, my, my, my sister, I was thinking about, about some of the kind of uh, political biographies that, but uh, so my sister's written a biography of Mrs. Rosa Parks um, and it's called The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks. And, and it's called that because Rosa Parks, you know, didn't just get tired one day um, and, and refused to give up her seat, but she had what she describes as a long life of a long history and life of being rebellious. And I think it's exactly that that we need to integrate into our social studies curriculums, right? You know, these stories, these histories, these biographies um, of, uh, you know, of leaders known and unknown who have really, um, uh, you know, transformed the society for the better um, and who tell a different history and a different uh, idea of who we are as a nation, where we've come and where we therefore can go. And I think, um, I think education is, is all in there. And I think especially, you know, history, social studies, humanities are, are, I mean, I, I like all the subjects, um, but, but I, but I think that, that, that it is possible and that there's some great resources out there. I mean, I love the work that Rethinking Schools is doing. I, I think the Howard Zinn Educational Project is putting together, you know, amazing um, social studies curriculums for teachers, for educators, um, and for young people. Um, I have my kids in some of, of their programming, but that, that, that is about us learning some of the real history um, and, and, and therefore some of the real folks that made history um, and their full stories. And I, and I think that that, that actually has a huge um, impact on everything. So thanks so much. Thank you. And in a number of different ways, this next question has been asked. And so what expectations do you have of the Biden administration in this struggle? And moreover, how do we address the 70 million people that seem not to be perhaps interested in these efforts? So uh, I think when it comes to, to uh, President-elect Biden, I mean, again, I, I think, um, you know, our campaign is very focused on, um, on keeping on pushing and, and holding whoever is elected at every level of office, you know, accountable to the needs and to the mandate of, of the people. And I think, um, I think that that mandate is actually clear. And so then therefore we have to, you know, continue to be loud and, and pushing and powerful, um, saying that it is indeed, um, it is indeed powerful and, and possible to, to, you know, to, to curb this pandemic, to rebuild our economy, to invest in education, to, to expand healthcare, to lay, raise living wages, and and that the vast, vast, vast majority of people um, in this country really, really want and really need that. Um, and then I think that actually connects to 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 the election results. And and I am no pollster, and we all know also that early voting and and voting. Um, and exit polls, which is mostly what we have right now, um, are are usually kind of wrong, and and our analysis that we kind of draw from them um, 
isn't is is kind of faulty. So so I'm not I'm not trying to, but but what I, what I what I what I want to kind of challenge people uh, with is that um, that that Trump might have won in Florida, but what beat either Trump or Biden in Florida was living wages, and that um, and that there are many folks who uh, who are in this country um, who really need and want change um, and that we have to keep on uh, talking to them. Um, and some of those folks uh, might have voted for Biden, some of those folks might have voted for Trump. Um, but I, I, but what, we, what we know is that um, that the majority of people, um, majority of Democrats, majority of Republicans want a universal health care system or, a, a, or some government responsibility for health care, um, that, that folks want a fair taxation system. And, and so I think what you do is you, you organize with those that agree um, on some of those really important policy positions and you keep on building. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I think, bef- you know, one of the, I think, real unfortunate um, analysis that came out of the 2016 election by looking at kind of exit polls a little too soon was that um, this false um, narrative that it was poor white people, working class white people that that put um, uh, Donald Trump in office. Um, and and all of the, the figures and numbers basically say that that's co- totally wrong. If, if poor and low income people across race, but including white, uh, poor white people had, had actually turned out in the same levels that um, higher income people had, had voted in, in the 2016 election, Trump would have not been president uh, for the past four years. Um, and then if you look at who voted um, in, in this election, um, again, uh, if close to half of the population and about a third of the electorate is poor and low income, um, the, those folk um, voted very clearly uh, for folks that were putting out healthcare and, and living wages and these kinds of programs. And so the hope really is uniting and organizing across all the lines that divide us, but those that are most impacted by injustice, because those folk really need and want um, change. And so I, I, it just, to me, it, it's, 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 it's maybe different than what we're hearing, um, but it's really important. It's really important that people know that fusion is possible, that poor white people and poor Latino people and poor black people and poor native people are coming together. It's happening. It's what changed this election. It's really important to know that poor and low income people hold the key to shifting things and that poor people have a power a power that's a voting power, um, that's a, an organizing power, and and therefore why it matters for us to kind of lift from the bottom and to prioritize around the needs of 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 the least of these who are actually really kind of most of us and who will um, and so so I I I, I just want to kind of make that point. I mean, it's not to say that. Um, that there aren't real differences and real divisions in our nation. Um, but the way that you unite and the way that you heal is by transforming and transforming the unjust structures that are impacting people, you know, um, in, in the, the very real present. Thank you so much. There are still so many questions and there is so much that we could continue to talk about, but I think that's really a beautiful way to end to remind us that, you know, that, we really can. We do have the opportunity to transform. And we do that by connection and interaction and by really meeting people, by really telling stories. And so thank you for thank you for your person, actually, you know, and thanks for for your presence and your work, your leadership, um, but your presence mostly. So so very, very, very grateful for your time. That was great energy and um, you, you handled those questions amazingly. So thank you so much for being with us today. It's great to be with you all and I appreciate working together. It's wonderful. At this moment, we are going to um, try to do a few things. We have the opportunity here now to take a break and we're gonna remind you to not walk away from your Zoom 
However, we also, um, Representative Rab is still here and knows that there were some questions posed to him that he's willing to answer over this break. So we will stay. Anybody who either posed a question or wants to be listening to this during this break time. We'd also encourage you um, at this moment to be sure that you have the program for today with you. Because of time, when we return, we'll have the opportunity to hear from a, a really wonderful panel. And we don't wanna take too much time um, doing any in major introductions of them. So their bios are all included in your program. And so we wanna just make sure that you have that with you as well. Um, and thank you everyone for your attention so far this morning. And I know that we didn't get to everyone's questions and um, I am sorry about that, but um, know that this was really a rich conversation. And so at this point, um, I'll stay here with anybody who wants to um, listen through the break to some questions that were posed to Representative Rab. Um, thank you for all the information regarding bills addressing re-entry and rehabilitation. Is House Bill 2040 going up for a vote during the ne next legislative session? Is there a bill addressing housing? Was there any pushback from police unions when working on House Bill 1841? <laughs> oh, you got all, I get all the juicy questions. <laughs> so, all right, folks, here we go. Let's start with 2040, uh, the Second Chance Jobs Act. Um, you know, that, that was, there, there are not many substantive bills that are bipartisan that, um, that, well, let, me re, let me step back. There are not many uh, substantive bills that Democrats are, feel strongly about that see the light of day in judiciary. So the fact that there was a Democratic bill that was with, had bipartisan support unanimously pushed out of the Judiciary Committee is a good sign. So if there is enough pressure on the right people in the right ways, we can reintroduce this bill in the new legislative session that starts December 1st. That is an if. There was, um, I, as you all know, probably that I'm a Democrat, so I, I'm in the House Democratic Caucus. Um, we lost three seats. So there could be folks in the Republican leadership in the House who say, you know what, our message is stronger than theirs and we don't need to cave to what Democrats want. And so even though there were some very popular bipartisan bills, they're not gonna be a priority because now that we have more power, we're just gonna focus on um, creating more criminal offenses and locking up more people, which is generally, and I, not, I really don't mean to say that as a partisan because there are Democrats who have the same ideology around criminal justice than many of my Republican colleagues. So I'm not meaning to say Democrats good, Republicans bad. Please don't misinterpret me. Uh, uh, I just want to lay the, the context out. So the context is there may not be an appetite for uh, Republicans to bring up this bill again or make it a priority anytime soon. But if there is diverse support around the state right? Not just from Black people, not just from Democrats, not just from Philly folks, not just from um, our elders, not whomever. But if there's broad support, particularly from people in those respective districts of people who serve on the Judiciary Committee, then there's hope because they do respond to public outcries. How do I know? Because when I was on earlier, I told you about all the successes we had based on the large scale um, peaceful protests that inspired more, um, shall we say, radical approaches to legislating. So it's possible. All right, the second question, please remind me because I can get down in the, get into the weeds, but I wanna make sure my, my answers are substantive and you know helpful. Okay, they just, hold on one second, they keep moving. All right, well, I, I'll talk about 1841 since that was my, my bill and okay. you can tell me the one that I skipped over. Um, so, Okay, 1841 was a, a serious tweak of my original bill that was ignored for years. The tweaks that were made were made to 
pacify the Fraternal Order of Police and other law enforcement organizations. So on the surface, it looked like it was 95% my bill, which was really about transparency and accountability and ensuring that law enforcement, um, chiefs of police notably, knew what they were getting before they, they made a formal offer to folks. Because no chief of police, no matter what you assume their politics are, whether they're pro-Black Lives Matter or pro-police reform or anti-anti-anti, nobody wants to hire a liability. Why doesn't the chief police want to hire a liability regardless of their politics? Because they don't want to get fired when that cop who they've hired turns out to be um, uh, deeply problematic, shall we say. That person will get fired. That chief of police will get fired. And or because of civil lawsuits against someone who kills, um, who shoots a teenager in the back, that could bankrupt an entire township or city. So it's not in anyone's best interest. The only people who are really against it have been the Fraternal Order of Police. But they tweaked my bill that created a loophole that the worst cops in, could just sneak right through. And I'm looking to uh, uh, amend that law, which is going to be very difficult over the next two years. But on the city level, we can close that loophole by saying anyone who has any meaningful um, transgressions uh, in terms of disciplinary action, um, we need a public record of who they are. And the people before hiring have to disclose that they are hiring or considering someone with a problematic background. That would close the loophole that the Fraternal Order of Police got snuck in to my bill against my strong opposition. So even though it, m m this new law um, is not perfect and has an awful loophole, we can fix it. And this, this law can be a blueprint for other states. And hopefully in other states where they do the right thing and learn the lessons from Pennsylvania, they can pass those bills into law and avoid those, those, um, those loopholes that are deeply problematic. And what was the one I missed? So I think the, the, just the in-between was if you wanted to say anything else about a bill addressing housing. A bill addressing housing. So um, I was shocked to learn that of the t two dozen standing committees in the Pennsylvania House of Representatives, uh, there is no committee on housing. Now, if you're a radical like me, you believe that housing is a human right. If you're a radical like me, you believe that human rights that, that human, not human rights, yes, uh, education, um, health care are human rights, if you're radical like me. Um, so I don't know why there's not a housing committee. Housing issues, if it deals with home ownership, it would go to commerce because that deals with banking and therefore mortgages. But housing issues would probably overwhelmingly go to the Urban Affairs Committee, um, which doesn't meet a lot. Uh, I used to be on Urban Affairs. Uh, I, I was in this past term. So for those of you interested in housing issues, you need to know who are the people, and I'll put it in a link. How about that? I'll put a link to um, the House um, Urban Affairs Committee. And then when you click on that link, you can click on all the, there'll be 15 Republicans and 10 Democrats who are on that, um, on that committee. Now, anyone can introduce legislation, whether they're on a committee or not, around housing. And I have colleagues who've done that. I have not taken the lead on that because you can't take the lead on everything. And I spread myself pretty thinly. But I believe that housing is a human right. I also believe that there's a great opportunity to create energy efficiency homes, new homes, and also weatherization that disproportionately benefits uh, folks of modest means and the working poor. That's really important when we talk about climate change, when we talk about the environment, when we talk about economic justice, we got to make sure that the one piece of wealth that um, folks who are not wealthy have, which is their home, um, is protected, right? And so, um, there are people who I work with in my caucus. When I say my caucus, that is all the House Democrats who work together in a caucus, 
who are taking the lead on that. My colleague, Representative uh, Elizabeth Fiedler from South Philly, she's uh, addressing a lot of issues. And my colleague in city council, a new colleague, um, uh, actually two, uh, Kendra Brooks, council member Brooks and council member Jamie Gautier, West, uh, West Philly. Um, they're doing it, she's around housing, as well as council member Helen Gim. They're doing a lot of good stuff. And when we work together on the local and state level and now on the federal level with an administration I think is gonna have better policies around um, housing, whether you're homeowners or renters, um, provides a lot of new opportunities, despite the fact that I will be serving another two years in the belly of the beast um, in uh, a chamber um, where it sounds like your priorities about asking about these issues are not the priorities of the folks who are running the legislation and deciding what gets to the House floor and what doesn't. Thank you so much. And I know that there were other questions for you too, but I, uh, I do believe we're out of time okay. uh, for this, well, but thank you for being willing to do that through the break. Well, thank you. you guys can reach me anytime at, at RepRab on Instagram or Twitter or facebook.com slash RepRab, and I'll be happy to answer all your questions. I really appreciate being, um, being a part of this. This is, a, this is a great conference, and I'm so glad to, to have been involved. Thank you so, so much for your My presence. Pleasure. And at this moment, we're going to make a transition um, and have the opportunity to hear from a wonderful panel. You might want to, at this point, switch your view to gallery view so that you'll be able to see all of the panelists here together. Um, it will just be uh, maybe easier for you to, to view everyone at this point. And just to say, in our first panel this morning, our panelists are going to address the systemic issues that perpetuate injustices toward youth what's often referred to and you've already heard referred to this morning as the horrific school to prison pipeline that's still in place for far too many of our citizens. And so we're gonna begin this panel this morning with Danell Drinks, who is the co-founder of Grown. And so we welcome Danell. Hello, how you doing, uh, Michelle? Thank you for having me. Um, <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be a, a part of this panel. And I just uh, would like that uh, to highlight the uh, issue of prisoners, uh, school to prison pipelines. One of the things that I think is overlooked uh, often is the uh, the uh, nuances that we are uh, put in at the initial onset of uh, education system. A lot of our young mills aren't truly uh, giving the opportunity to prosper by not being giving uh, things that nurture their individuality. They are put in a situation where they are forced to, <clears throat> excuse me, forced to uh, conform to a system that doesn't have their best interests at hand and they feel it and they know it. So as a result of it, they are often giving um, they feel ostracized and not given the opportunity to succeed. And when they are highlighted, it's highlighted in a negative light. It's highlighted in a way that brings them a stigma of uh, being less than. And as a result of that, often it results in uh, being misdiagnosed with behavior problems. And next thing you know, their record, are, their record becomes <clears throat> excuse me, record becomes uh, filled with misconduct and, and, and bad negative uh, reports in the school system, which pretty much perpetuates their life in a direction that often leads to prison. This is uh, um, not nothing new. This is not nothing that hasn't been seen uh, in various lights. And unfortunately, it's now becoming so pervasive, we find that it became the norm. And nobody speaks on it, nobody highlights it, nobody actually um, talk about it. And unfortunately, we're in a society where the squeaky wheel gets the grease. So a lot of the young men and women in our school system aren't acknowledged for their uh, achievements unless they are acting out or deemed to be have act out. So with that being the case, I think that we need to really bring attention to um, this issue 
and before beforehand. And unfortunately, we are plagued in a society with violence and in a culture of violence. And so when a lot of our kids that are impressionable emulate a lot of the things they see, they are deemed the problem or the cause of, and in all actuality, only conforming to uh, an environment that has cultivated that mentality for them. So, so often uh, we overlook that. So in the discussion moving forward, I think we need to not only see our children as children, and that's not to um, be apologetic or overlook those that do act out and those that do need to be uh, uh, addressed, the issues need to be addressed, but let's address it from an issue of what trauma has been uh, introduced to them in their lives and their cultures and their neighborhoods and in the school system. So we need to look at this from a holistic perspective and not only highlight them in a negative light when they are acting up or deemed to be have acting up. Thanks, Danielle, so much for um, just reminding us about viewing this all from a holistic perspective. We're grateful, certainly, for your presence with us. And at this time, we invite Keir Bradford Gray, who serves as the Chief Defender and the Executive Director at the Defender Association of Philadelphia, to make her remarks. Hello. Uh, how are you? Thank you so much for inviting me uh, to this very important discussion. One, I really uh, did appreciate hearing the words of Mr. Drinks about holistic review and understanding. Um, some of the things I want to talk about in terms of juveniles coming into this system um, really relates to how we label behavior. And what I see in my system are young black and brown boys coming into the system for behaviors which I know they could grow out of if they are given the right types of alignment with supportive systems and supportive structures to make sure that they grow out of these behaviors in the right way. Um, one of the things I think we need to make sure we do is not overuse our justice system to take care of behaviors that we would really count on and rely on professionals in social services, uh, in social welfare, psychologists, all of those people that really understand the trauma and the history that some of our kids go through now that I hadn't really experienced as a kid growing up. Now, for me, I know I've experienced some things that are related to poverty because my parents, you know, um, they didn't have a lot of money and we lived in an inner city neighborhood. But I know that I see children come through the justice system for behaviors that I engaged in when I was younger. And thank God for the times that, that were so different back then, because if I were growing up today with some of the stimulus that some of these kids have and some of the, the, the issues related to poverty, I would never be able to become a lawyer because my behaviors would have been criminalized and would have stuck with me and stigmatized me so that I could not reach my full potential. And so I talk from the perspective of what do we want to cure for and how do we how do we carefully use our justice system to make sure that we're not doing more damage than good. My, my office is the Defender Association of Philadelphia. We represent children as young as 10 years old up into 17 years old uh, in the juvenile system. And I represent adults as well. Many of the, the adults that I represent were in the juvenile system, which means that our system which is based on rehabilitation has failed in a lot of ways. And instead of re-examining where we failed, we continue to penalize the person who has now lost their victim status and now is a perpetrator only. And that does not help any of us in terms of achieving public safety. When you talk about children and why they're doing some of the things they do, you have to look at what the treatment they've been given. And if they feel like the, the sense of worthlessness has been perpetuated against them, they're never going to get the full understanding of how great they are or how loved they are and develop that empathy that we want human beings to develop. I think it's a common sense approach in terms of what we're doing, but we've been so brainwashed into believing that this is the only way to deal with child behaviors. Uh, I know that there are so many different things that children are going through now uh, than what I've seen when I was younger because of access to a lot of uh, stimulus in terms of internet, media, social media, um, you know, just the, the graphics that are able to be shown now that weren't able to be shown when I was, I was younger. But those things still can be controlled and handled in a, very, in a therapeutic environment if we had the will and the desire to do so. 
And I keep hearing a lot that we don't have the money to provide certain things to kids in schools. We have to take out guidance counselors. We have to take out people that can really contextualize what a child is going through and replace them with school resource officers, which is AKA police officers. And I say, no, we don't. And I really, really hope that many more people start to stand up and speak out against this practice that we need police officers in our schools to keep our children safe. Police officers are reactive. They are not preventive. And so when they are in these schools, they are there and they are really getting, um, we are getting more arrests from schools than we had before uh, police officers were involved. And I do think that there is a systemic issue with that. Uh, one of the things I want to make sure that we understand, uh, I do an inventory in my office to figure out who's in our system and why. And what I've seen in our office in our juvenile justice practice is 100% of the youth that are in placements are black and brown. 100% of the youth that are in placements that we represent are black and brown. And most of those youth come in for misdemeanor, um, I guess, behaviors because the label crime is in the behold is, is basically the beholder of the label crime is the one that gets to, to say that this is this action should belong in the system. There's a lot of discretion that is being used for non black children that will never label their behavior crimes instead in need of therapeutic resources. And I want to challenge us to do better by our youth especially our black and brown kids who are often misjudged, mischaracterized, looked at as more um, older than they are, looked at as more culpable, as well as more, more likely to be violent. Where is that imagery coming from? And when we are in the leadership position to label behaviors crimes worthy of the justice system's response, I think we need to take a deep inventory of ourselves and ask ourselves why. Would we label this behavior a crime if committed by someone in a more affluent neighborhood who was white, who had support systems? And how would we handle that? Uh, it's time for us to stop justifying this system's approach to uh, public safety when we don't see the return on that investment in terms of public safety and how we're dealing with children in this system. In fact, when you do a data study, as we have done, you see more children who have hit the juvenile system continue those behaviors in their adult lives. And so that to me has been a false sense of security and has been something that has damaged some of our communities uh, more so than did good. So I will challenge us for the rest of this conference really to think about ways that as leaders who make decisions that we can start to understand our own biases, our own blind spots, our own gaps, and make more careful and considerate decisions as to who should be placed in our justice system. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to share. Here, thank you for your work and for challenging us to do better for our children, especially our black and brown children. Thank you so much. And next we invite Josh Staub, who is the Director of Restorative Programming for the School District of Philadelphia. Josh? So I think what I really wanna focus on is, is this idea of um, love and humanity in schools. Um, I also want to push back on, on the idea that, um, that justice is reactionary. I don't believe it is. I think, you know, in the district, we've had a lot of conversations around, you know, first, you know, moving from a model that's, you know, equality based when it's equity based, and now talking about moving from a model that's equity based potentially to a model that's justice based. And what we're talking about is systems change you know, changing the systems that are causing harm. And so when I talk about restorative justice, I would say the bulk of the work in schools is centered around community building. That is the heart and soul of restorative justice for us out in Oakland, California. And then, you know, here in Philadelphia, because basically, you know, what I learned in Oakland, I'm implementing in Philly. And so, you know, yes, we do the traditional uh, mediation, you know, the harm and healing aspects of sort of justice, we also do work around like, you know, circles of support and accountability for our, our extra love kids, our kids who need more love, you know, more, more patience, more kindness. But the bulk of our work is in preventing a harm from happening in the first place. And we do that through community building circles. We do that through restorative conversations. But the heart of that is love and humanity. Um, so going back to like school to prison pipeline and understanding that like, a huge part of school to prison pipeline. Like one of our biggest challenges in Oakland 
was the fact that we were basically feeding this pipeline students through um, suspensions, basically any kind of punitive discipline that was pushing kids out of our buildings. And a lot of it was intentional. You know, a lot of folks feel like, oh, we can't teach these, these students for this, these number of reasons. And myself growing up, I was one of these extra love students. I was one of the, I was a student who was pushed out of buildings. It was very clear to me, um, especially in my high school years, that I was not only like unwanted in specific classrooms, but I wasn't wanted in the school itself. And it had a huge effect on me, you know, from like um, truancy, you're looking at my behaviors, you can see that, you know, what led to a lot of um, my explosive behaviors in school. And so one of the pieces that we're looking at is, you know, yes, we need alternatives to suspension that, that are restorative. So, you know, mediation is, is, a, is a really good one. Um, like a harm and healing circle is a really great alternative. And we've had huge success. I'm thinking about like one of our biggest schools in North Philly, K to eight, you know, our, their admin teams really, really bought in and they do it really well. And they did 183 of these circles last year as an alternative to suspension. And they were all successful, meaning agreements were reached. They were never broken the whole year. Like even ones that were done in like October, November, they didn't come back. So when done really well, um, we can definitely, 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 you know, keep kids in our buildings and keep them, you know, from entering, entering, uh, or being pushed out and potentially entering the school to prison pipeline. Um, but it involves our adults buying in. And, and that's the challenge in RJ. Um, I also want to say that, um, you know, we still, we still, you know, focus on the healing work, you know, being able to respond to things that do happen. So even though we're very focused on the prevention work, the community building work, um, because on, on the prevention side, like I want to challenge the idea that enforcement equals safety. Okay. So we're, I know the other panel is happening later on. People will be hearing from chief Bethel, you know, and, and, and how he's reforming school police in Philadelphia. Like one of those reforms is having school safety officers going deep into the RJ work, you know, cohorts of, of officers that are deep into this harm and healing work, the preventative work. Um, what I wanna challenge is this idea that enforcement's necessary. The ch to, me, to me, true safety is in community building. If we have strong, loving, you know, human-centered communities, we don't need enforcement anymore. It goes away, the need for it. But again, you know, we're still gonna live in, you know, the world we live in. And so we're, we're still pushing out, you know, our harm and healing work. A lot of that's done through youth empowerment. So we train, we train students as peer mediators. We also train students in how to be community building circle leaders. My vision for Philly is that as this grows, it's gonna be taken over by the youth completely. And so us adults that are like facilitators or directors, we're taking a big step back. And we're going to just be these, the elders that are supporting the youth in this trajectory, using these tools that have been basically given to us by our ancestors to use, the circle work. And then we're, we're also going to heavily focus on our extra love kids, making sure that we have, that we're doing our circles of support and accountability, that when a kid comes out of placement, for instance, that they're being welcomed back into our community. We're using welcome circles. So any, any place that we can infuse love, humanity and relationships within the structure, that's what we're trying to do. Josh, thanks for the images that you offered that really show what's possible when we really do work with community building. So thank you for that. And now we invite Brian Foster a youth court trainer. Brian? Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me. This is really cool. Like, I'm, I'm really excited um, to hear from the other panelists. I'm like, I'm just a student right now, so I'm taking it all in. But uh, I am, I'm Brian Foster. I am currently a, a trainer and advisor for youth courts. Uh, I, get, I guess I can talk about my journey a little bit and like, where, where my plans are now in the future or in the present and for the future. But I, uh, I originally, uh, for those who don't know what Youth Court is, Youth Court is a alternative disciplinary program designed to combat uh, school suspensions and also uh, school to prison pipeline. Uh, my, my relationship with Youth Court started in my freshman year in high school 
where I got into trouble. So I was I wasn't a volunteer at the time. I was a respondent, and uh, we use the term respondent uh, for for students who uh, commit offenses in the school based setting. I was a respondent. Um, I was involved with the fight. You know, just so happens that this program is coming about in Chester uh, called Youth Court, and it's designed to keep you in school and not suspend you because uh, in my school setting, zero tolerance was a big thing. Zero tolerance was, uh, in, 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 in a sense, not, not uh, dialogue and interacting with students and asking how a student may have felt about what they experienced was not important to climate managers or people in uh, positions as such as a principal, especially in a, a zero tolerance uh, school. So I was used to getting suspended. I was used to, you know, doing my suspensions, coming back to the same school environment that wasn't really in the best interest of me at the time. And uh, I got into a pretty bad fight, uh, got introduced to youth court. I'm like, what the heck is youth court? And my experience was crazy. I walked in. I hardly saw any adults. I saw all students. And I'm like, what's going on? And then I went through this process where I was being questioned about what happened. Uh, how was I feeling? What made me react this way? And I'm like, all right, I'm being questioned. I'm being asked about this situation. If I was in a, uh, in a, in a principal's office, we wouldn't have had this conversation. It would have been three days, go home. So going through this experience, uh, it kind of changed my mindset a little bit. Uh, I got my disposition, what we usually call sentences, but we use the term disposition because we want to stay away from like the punitive system. Um, I got my disposition and one of the, one of the dispositions uh, was jury duty. So I had to come back, serve on a jury. And now I'm in a position where I'm asking another student questions that I was asked and having this reflective period where we're, 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 we're exchanging dialogue and we're getting to the root of the problem. Then we're talking about how we can fix the problem. And then I got hooked. So once I served my, my, my uh, jury duty and community service, I decided to come back as a volunteer. And that's be, that began my, my, my journey uh, to me now being a trainer and advisor. So going through that experience where I, uh, I would come after school, I meet other people that I usually wouldn't talk to throughout the day. And now we all have a common goal is to help another student stay in school. And my 10th grade, 11th grade year was uh, rooted in that work. And then my, my junior year in high school, I ended up testifying against uh, the Luzerne County judge uh, who was a part of the kids for uh, cash scandal. And while I didn't really think it was a big deal, I was, th I was talking about how great youth court is and how it can help students. As an adult, I, I, I read, the, read the article and was like, oh, wow, I played a big part in, in combating school to prison pipelines. So it just gave me this uh, hunger for more. What can I do to spread this message and spread awareness about youth courts and how they work for students that look like me. And uh, ended up, after I graduated, advocating for the program, um, getting offered a position in 2013 to work as a trainer and advisor. Uh, that led to uh, working with awesome people and then working a part of a, a, a joint state committee to implement youth courts in all of PA. And, where, where I am now mentally, as far as this program, I, I still feel as eager about it as I did when I was younger, because I believe that if we give, these, give the tools and the resources to black and brown students, you know, we're gonna create so many leaders. We're gonna create, uh, we're gonna create change that I really believe in. So I feel like my position as a trainer and advisor is to make sure that I'm here for dialogue with other students. I'm here to give tools and resources and I'm here to, uh, 
you know, train the, train the, the next leader. Um, these are all things that I really believe in and I'm really happy to be a part of this panel. So thank you. Great. So um, thank you guys for uh, those amazing introductions. And uh, I am not Michelle Lester. Uh, so I, I apologize for those that thought Michelle was coming back. She will be right back. Uh, but I am going to take this time to uh, ask questions of our panel. Uh, so uh, I want you to start putting questions into the question and answer so we can make sure that we get your questions answered uh, for anyone on the panel today. So before we get, uh, before we start to take questions, I am going to pose uh, a couple of questions to our panelists. So one of the things that I believe in is um, not falling in love with the solution, but absolutely falling in love with the problem. And I think that, and that's the way that's the way we solve it, right? If we're so too tied to the solution, we can't, you know, think past that. And so, really, what I want us to do is to talk about uh, the problem for a minute, to define it, to discuss it, for us to really understand it. I think that that would benefit the audience tremendously. And so, what I'll start with, and I'll go back to our first panelist and something that he said. Um, so, Dino Drinks uh, spoke to an issue with young adults, particularly around. Um, having to conform to a system that does not have their best interests at heart. And so before we get into the solutions component of this, I really want to start talking about what that system is. And so, you know, and, and, and I'm going to um, pose this to both Donnell and Brian to start uh, this in based on your experience. Can you talk about what leads into creating this prison to this uh, school to prison pipeline and, and start in the community, right? So, so how do you know, what do you feel? What does this look like? And, and really talk about what that pipeline looks like to you from your side of the equation. Uh, thank you. That's a good question. What I'll say is we talk about how marginalized our communities are, how black and brown people are looked at as underclass citizens, but what we negate to, uh, emphasize is as a community they're looked at that way. So what are they, uh, image are they giving our children? What image are we seeing as a child? We are never brought an equation when we're talking about empowerment or self-confidence. So our thing is we find ourselves emulating actions that are negative or stereotypical ne uh, images that are fed to us. So what I say when I spoke upon that, when I say that it's um, don't have our best interest at hand is because I'm young enough and old enough to have went through an era of the crack epidemic. And in that era, there was so much imagery put on in our community that I find myself emulating a lot of the actions. Um, as you know, I was previously incarcerated for 27 and a half years. Um, and, and that wasn't, uh, I don't say that to give excuses for my life's choices, but I give context to what I understand as being um, what I was fed, the trauma that I experienced, the things that I saw. And that wasn't, and it was emphasized on every level. I remember being a good school, student in school and I went to a school where they told all the black kids to go to trade schools. So when the high schools came, we went to trade schools, but all the white, the white kids were pushed to academic uh, high schools. These things right there show that we already have, or they already have a predetermined, uh, predetermined script what they feel that we should play. So when I say that doesn't have our best in interest in hand, I, that's way before we even touch the justice system. Then you put me in a justice system where I was a child dealing with grown up issues. There was nobody there to advocate on my behalf. They were telling my family who never had uh, any justice contact to rely on a lawyer that didn't even take the time to truly understand me as a child. So when I say don't have our best interest at hand, it's at every level. It's not only the imagery that we fed, it's about when we're in a system, do we have advocates that truly speak on our behalf and truly understand um, what would be best for us? And like we say, I'm, I'm told you, I tell you one, I always say that I don't uh, negate anybody's need to take responsibility for their actions, but everybody's uh, actions doesn't require the punishment that is dissed out. What's best at, what's best interest is to have us grow into um, 
the best men and women that we can become. That's what's best for a child. Thank, no, no, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and uh, thank you for sharing, obviously, uh, your story and the impact that it's had on you. I think that is tremendous, tremendously helpful in um, us to begin to understand uh, what the system is and how it's created and how it's shaped. Uh, so I would love to go over to uh, Brian Foster to talk about your experiences as it relates to how do you view uh, particularly the front end of this prison, uh, the school to prison pipeline? Yeah. Um... Donnell, man, I appreciate your story um, for sure. I was, you know, definitely a couple of things that like I definitely identify with. Uh, ninth grade year, high, sc uh, high school. Um, I'll even go as far as back to eighth grade when uh, the first time I ever went through a metal detector and I was confused as why, uh, like, what's this for? I came, you know, we came from saying good morning to a teacher and not have to check your bags in for weapons and stuff. So, that was an interesting experience for me from eighth grade to ninth grade. And I'm just like, why? Why am I going through this? That was always a question that I had when I was younger. Uh, but, you know, as an adult, I kind of understand. You know, I had, to I had to identify the type of environment that I lived in. I lived in Chester, PA, where the violence rates are crazy, especially it trickles down to school violence. So going through metal detectors, uh, the zero tolerance policy was, you know, uh, introduced to me at an early age. And, you know, you know, I read in, you know, a couple of books and did some research on like what what's rooted in zero tolerance related to the war on drugs. And this idea that we're not going to take any problem. We're going to have zero tolerance on any type of issue going on in school. Um, and all these things were like mind blowing to me, especially at that transition to high school. So I felt victim to it. You know what I'm saying? Like it was easy, like the same people that I would play action figures with. I grew up where, you know, blood members as I got older and they were living certain lifestyles. And these are the same people that I'm like, yo, this is the homie. I know he fights. I know he, you know, rep, reps a certain gang, but this is still my friend. So it was normal. It was it, it was normal to be around these people. I didn't look at them in a negative light. You know, these are these are just the homies. But then as I got older and I realized that there wasn't many resources for creating dialogue and to look at alternatives to how we can solve a problem. It was just a constant like, you know, you do the, you do the crime, you do the time, even if it's a, a suspension. It's like that 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 type of mentality, and I was just like, well, like, where's where's the alternatives? And you know, when I came to youth court, that changed my whole dialogue. Like that changed my whole outlook on how we solve problems. You know, like we went from, oh, this is normal. Going through metal detectors is normal. Seeing gang fights, all this stuff, this is normal to us. You know what I'm saying? People that aren't that's not from my community will be very, very intimidated. But I went through it, you know, and I can assure him like, ah, oh, it's whatever. But now we have a different conversation. Now, if I'm identifying the problems that you're intimidated by, well, well, how can we, you know, how can we go about changing changing the conversation? What are we talking about here? We we know the problems that we go through on a day to day basis. Um, and, you know, that, that was a lot of there was a lot of questions in that realm for me. Uh, especially in my earlier years in high school um, and how I'm viewing these problems now. You know, I'm not so shocked at certain uh, behaviors because of the conditioning of our, our environment. You know, there's certain things that go on in our communities that just condition people to be uh, used to it. So, you know, we're talk you're talking about the problems in the school to prison pipeline and how that's related. Um, yeah, <laughs> I'm just rambling about, but I think the point I'm trying to come to is that uh, people are used to a certain lifestyle that's been introduced to them, especially when it comes to how people tackle just like injustice and what they think they think is like bad behavior versus what people are used to and what they think is normal behavior. And to have this conversation is to start is, is to, to start introducing 
alternatives and programs that's going to restore problems that we have. So that's, that's my view on it. Right. Thank you for that. Um, and, and thank you for your insight, insight and your passion around it. Right. And, and really sharing your story as well. Um, you know, and, and again, I think just like I, I said to Donnell, I think that it helps to move to understanding. And so, Josh, I'm going to go over to, to you um, for a moment. And, uh, and I want you to talk about two things, right? Because we're talking about the system. And so obviously you're squarely within um, uh, the system as it relates to being with the school district of Philadelphia. Uh, but in your opening remarks, uh, you had uh, an opportunity to also talk about your own personal experience in, a, in your opening remarks as you came up. And so one of the things uh, that uh, Kia Bradford Gray talked about um, that I'll actually call out, I don't know if she necessarily used this language, um, but the disparity between um, different communities and social economic classes. And so, you know, Josh, I, I want you to start with really talking about it as you hear Brian and Danelle talk about their experience and think about it as it relates to yours and potentially the um, treatment, whether it was similar or different um, in the way that you were brought up and your experiences that you had as you uh, moved through uh, or matriculated through school, right? Because I'm not going to necessarily say the system, but how maybe that could have impacted you because of where you are socioeconomically, racially, you know, and, and so I want you to think about that. And then, you know, I would also love you to move into thinking about the um, systemic issues that uh, exist currently that obviously you're looking to change through the work that you're currently doing. So um, I, will, I will pause there for, uh, for you to give us your remarks. Yeah, sure. So uh, growing up, um, just put it in context, like I'm from a small town, man, up in Pennsylvania. We call it that area Pennsylvania because it's like, you, you, you already know, we, we watched it, you know, on, you know, the last week, we saw how divided Pennsylvania is. And so most folks where I'm from, well, when I was growing up, were white, period. Um, very little people of color. And so very insular, rural, um, lower income folks, for sure. I mean, my father was a factory, he's still a factory worker. I worked in a factory for 10 years as a young person. So a lot of farmers, that kind of thing, blue collar, Christian. Um, I would say one of the similarities that I would share with a lot of the youth here in Philly that I work with, or when I was in Baltimore or in Oakland, um, was, is the trauma. So the trauma was, was similar in a lot of ways. The, uh, the harm, the fact that it was chronic, it, it didn't just happen once. It was happening a lot. It was happening frequently. And so living in that trauma for a long period of time. Um, another, I would say, connection is the disconnect between the, the, the youth and the adults. So I draw a line between like, there is there are elders in our community and there are just older adults. Um, some of those adults are our leaders and they're not elders. The, the love isn't there, the understanding, the empathy, it doesn't exist. And so I had to walk a narrow line and it was a hard line to walk. Now, I would say the big difference is the privilege that I have growing up. So for me, you know, because I have white skin, I don't have the, I don't have a glass ceiling. And so I could be born into a very challenging situation and have all this disconnect. And, um, I, and I was involved in the system, you know, I've been arrested and I've gone through that system as a young person. Um, but it was a markedly different process for people like me. Um, now my family is, is, is very diverse. You know, we're, we're a mixed family racially, you know, my wife is black, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm white, but you know, part of my culture comes from the Middle East. So we're a very diverse family. I'm gonna have to have conversations with my son. So I have a one-year-old son, beautiful, beautiful boy. I'm gonna have to have conversations with this young man that I did not have to have growing up. Um, so very different in terms of the privilege piece. Even though I came from a background of chronic trauma, and, and poverty to some extent, you know, we homelessness to some extent at one point, the privilege was always there. The safety net was always there. And so that's a major difference that I see, you know, working in these, in these urban environments where the privilege is not there. Um, that kind of gets us into that second piece, the, uh, the systemic issues, right? And so when we talk about the systemic issues, whether it's, um, the school to prison pipeline, which is happening, you know, in the criminal justice world, it's happening in the schools. 
there's demographics of people that are affected, you know, in negative ways, you know, way more than other groups. So you got folks that look like me. That's everybody already knows on this call. Like we're, we're benefiting from it. It's, 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 it's in our best interest to keep it going because, you know, folks that look like me, man, we, we get away with things. We have for a long time, as opposed to um, in Oakland, young black males. And you could see it in the data because in Oakland, the, the, the racial demographic of the city is very evenly split. It's 30% white, 30% black, 30% Latinx. Well, our data, our suspension data in our incarceration data, it's insanely disproportionate, especially to our African-American male students. And then, you know, when I was transitioning here to Philadelphia, you know, coming back home to, 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 to PA, um, we were seeing like an uptick in suspensions with their African-American female students. It's like, man, we've moved from like one demographic to another. And so when I think about like systemic issues that we want to address, like right now, like what's, what's, what's the, uh, the number one thing that we want to see change is it's, it's this disproportionality. You know, we, we, I, you know, I want to, I want to see alternative suspension happen across the board for everybody. Right. But like, the one piece that like really needs to be highlighted and called out and like put up on billboards is like, man, like even though we're, in, we're, we're implementing RJ and we're implementing alternatives to suspension, like, you know, we have these beautiful things, man. We have the youth court, we got harmony healing circles. We got this beautiful stuff happening. We're still disproportionate. And so that's, that is the number one systems change. And I think it's, it's going to come from shouting it out and making sure everybody understands that it's happening where we live. It's not just happening in Oakland, California. It's happening in Philly. So making people aware of that. Josh, thank you. Um, and, and, and thank you for sharing as well. Uh, you know, as we're going through this panel, uh, I just want to commend you all for um, how you're really connecting um, back and really making it really personal and, and sharing your own experiences. Uh, and so I, I do want to recognize that because not that's not always easy to do, uh, particularly in a public setting. So I, I really want to... Uh, applaud you for your um, your courage in, in doing that and really um, sharing with us. Uh, so I would like to move over to uh, Kier, uh, Kier Bradford Gray to um, talk about it uh, from the macro perspective, right? So you see it, you see the entire system. And uh, from the beginning to the end, you, you've heard uh, Daniel Drinks, you've heard Brian Foster, you've heard Josh Staub um, talk about their experiences and talk about the leading into this system. And then also in your opening remarks, you talked about um, the overuse of the criminal justice system um, in, in issues that should be handled uh, in another way. So I would love for you to take a moment to speak to that. Well, thank you so much, Atif. Um, I appreciate everyone's remarks. And I want to make sure we understand that my office represents tens of thousands of kids a year. And we see so many people, so many behaviors. And I'm, I'm, never, I'm not going to call them crimes anymore. I'm calling them behaviors because labelers put those words on actions depending upon the doer. I know that for a fact. I have seen it, um, not just in my professional life, but my personal life. My children were fortunate enough to be able to go to a private school. And when they were in that private school uh, at the graduation, they had an opportunity to reflect and thank those who are most instrumental in helping them through tough times. Those children at that graduation got up and said, I want to thank the counselor when I took something from the store and she helped me deal with that. I want to thank the counselor when I had a fight um, and we, we got through that. I want to thank the counselor when I said a derogatory word to the teacher. Those are the things that I see kids, black and brown kids, come to me for. Those are exactly those things. And so when I'm sitting here understanding the types of discretion that has been given and me as a practitioner in this system, even as a young practitioner, accepting that these, these things had to come to the system and working them up as a crime, I was very complicit in this idea that the system had to be used for these certain behaviors. Um, now that I have had experience as a young young practitioner, now as an administrator and a policymaker, I know we can do so much different. But it really starts with people who are in these positions of leadership to look at themselves, contextualize your own behaviors and think, what would I want for myself, my younger self, or for my family? And if this is not the path, why would you be content with allowing it to be the path for other people who need so much more 
uh, than the punitive response. And we can talk about what a system is and what it isn't, but I'm sorry. I see a system as reactive. The system that I'm in is very reactive. It is definitely not proactive and it has not helped people break the chain and cycle of generational trauma and poverty the way it should. Because why we're so much more focused on being politicized and being in the paper. If this young kid turns out to be the detriment that we labeled him as, I'm gonna be the one that my face is in the paper. I'm gonna be the one that can't advance. And for me, my purpose is bigger than the job. And so I'm going to say some of the things that people don't wanna hear, especially in this moment, in terms of looking at race and how race is at the forefront of these decisions in terms of what we do with people, in terms of the deposits and the investments that we give or don't give to some kids, because you can't tell me that people wouldn't understand lack of investments in a kid and how that manifests itself in behaviors that they don't even understand until they're faced with an issue that they now have to react to. And, and not to give that credence to kids, but really make it go for the easy solution, stick them in the justice system is not what we need to be. And in this civil rights moment, we need to demand much more, much more uh, authentic, understanding much more, you know, when, when we can, we can't even sue systems for racial, um, for, for racist practices, because we have to prove that there was a racist intent. But here's what I think we need to be doing. When we present alternatives to this system, because it has a disproportionate impact on black and brown people that is really harming their opportunities, and our systems leaders do not accept that alternative, then that to me, we can now in, 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 infer a racist intent. Because if you don't do something different, when you are seeing that these things are having such a huge impact on the future opportunities of young black and brown community uh, kids in these communities, it is time for us to do or try bolder reform that we know has been studied, that has worked much more effectively. So, uh, I mean, you know, obviously I can talk about this forever because I'm so passionate about it. But I do want to say something, and this is this is on behalf of what Brian Foster and Donnell Drinks has said. Public defenders are not, we are not um, absolved from our complicit behavior in this system. And so as we always are the antagonizers, pushing on other people to do better, we need to recognize where did we help for these people or these kids become entangled in this system because we did not take the time to recognize our own blind spots and understand the kid enough to be the best advocate we could be. And so I, I'm gonna challenge all of us, my office, everyone, to be the anti-racist, recognize why you would label young black boys and girls as more hyper-violent, hyper-sexualized than they should be and check ourselves because it starts with the decision maker. And so I appreciate that opportunity. I hope I wrote an op-ed about this, uh, Atif, and maybe it can be shared, but it really is time for us to look at ourselves and say, where can I be better in my implicit bias or my blind spots? Yeah, you know, thank thank you for that. Um, and 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 I, you know, you're absolutely right. And I, I applaud you for um, not only challenging the system, but challenging yourself and your office to to do better. And and so I, I definitely appreciate that. I would say um, I would be very interested in um, that op-ed. And uh, if interested, we can send it out to everyone that attended uh, this conference today to make sure everyone has a copy of that to be able to read it. So uh, thank you for that offer. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. So I want to shift gears a little bit now and, and actually start to incorporate some questions that I'm getting in in a question and answer um, as part of this and shifting gears and starting to move to from the problem, which we we've, I think, done a great job and really started to articulate and underscore there. Uh, you know, even one of the questions talking about the impact of um, the system and influences at as early as five years old with uh, Donnell and, and um and with uh, Brian uh, speaking to uh, the early age impact, right? And so we started to speak to some of that. Uh, we started to speak to, you know, the experience of, of going to, to grade school and going to metal detectors. But as we move past that, um, let's think about the solutions to it. And so the first question um, that comes from the question and answer, which factors do you look at in juvenile, juvenile delinquency restorative justice in order to determine how to best help those young people in need? 
And I'll open it up to anyone that wants to start with that question. So I, can I just say this? There's no sure. checklist on how to look at certain factors. Everyone is individualized. And so I think we need to move away from this, you know, standard of checking off boxes that allows us to make decisions and really figure out how to be better listeners and, and better introspective people about the experience that others have had. And so I, I just want to start with that because, um, you know, I hear a lot of clinicians talking about factors, factors, and yes, those are important, but we also need to start with the person as a whole. Care, thank you for saying that. Um, and that's the key point because that's the most important thing that I felt when I was engaged in the system, that they took a monolithic approach to dealing with me. Um, and the problem with that is everybody is affected different by different situations. While two people might be hit by a car, so to speak, one might get a broken leg and one might just get a scar on their knee. But just because you got a hit in car, uh, being hit by a car in your record doesn't mean that you in, 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 in suit, the same trauma ensued. So when we talk about what factors do we look at, I think that one of the first things in our communities, we need more um, hands-on approach with mentoring at every level. We need to open our children up to different levels of experiences. We need to let them know not only what is possible if they do right, what is possible if they do wrong. The thing is, we don't have that opportunity. And that's why I, I, I um, self-promotion right now. That, that's why I like to work with a lot of kids and let them know that your decisions can impact your life for the rest of your life. And that's not a, a tale of uh, uh, um, braggadocious, but listen, there's alternatives to what you can do and what can come from where you um, started out at. And we don't have enough of that. We have too many clinicians. We have too many academias. We have too many people coming into our communities and telling us what our problem is instead of listening to the children and asking them what is their problem and what can, because a lot of things we deem a problem isn't a problem. It's just an issue they're dealing with. We make it the problem. And so when we magnify it and we're, we're taught to listen to adults as children, if an adult says the problem, now there's a problem. But if an adult would have came with a, it as an issue with a solution-based issue, guess what? It would have altered the a direction of a lot of our children's lives. So to, um, I might have went left with the question, but the question is, there is not a monolithic approach. And I'm glad. Thank you, Kara, for saying that. Uh -huh. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I Thank you, Kara. Thank you, Donnell. Because like, like I said, I'm sitting here being a student right now, and I'm like soaking all this, all this information in. Um, with my experience in youth court, uh, especially being at my high school where the counselor was mainly focused on changing and switching your classes and not so much having a conversation with you about how your day's going, that was crazy. So, you know, imagine being a student, right? You got into an argument with the teacher and the scenario goes two ways, right? You go to the principal's office or climate manager and they're just like, What's this about? They got a hundred other cases, uh, other referrals that they have to deal with. So first thing you'd say, hey, listen, I'm going to give you two days, come back. All right, that's it. That's the conversation. On the other hand, we have a scenario where you walk into a classroom or a court-based court classroom and you having a conversation with students that go through the same thing you go through. Oh, that teacher? She wrote you up because you, you didn't have a pencil to class? Like you didn't have a pencil to do work? That's what you're here for? Okay, what do you think you can do differently about this situation? Maybe be prepared? Would you like to sit down and have a conversation with the teacher? These are all questions that's asked through this process. And when I took from that process alone is like, we need to have more dialogue amongst each other. So we need to just have, sit down and have a talk. You know, like that, the idea of like um, everybody really quickly, everybody at school had that one favorite teacher that they would go to. It was always that one teacher. Why is it that that one teacher has an effect on these students versus other teachers? Maybe that one teacher is having a conversation, seeing how you're doing. Even if you're that problematic student everybody talks about, if that one teacher has that effect on that problematic student, that we need to rethink how we're handling students or youth. 
So maybe we should, you know, model our behavior after that one teacher who's understanding, you know, all these points that are being brought up. That's understanding. That's able to have a conversation to this. Like so in, in, in the schools, we do what's called like a multi-tiered approach. That means we are breaking the work down into three buckets. Like I was saying before, the big bucket is that first bucket, which is the community building. It's like it's what you're talking about, Brian, like that, that space for us to talk. This is preventative stuff, man. Imagine if like you're at high school, right? And, and you have this advisory class and your class circles up twice a week. And you had students that designed the circle. You got students that are leading the circle. The teacher's in circle with the folks and answering the questions that come around. A lot of it's getting to know you stuff, but some of it can be heavy stuff. Like once we've built trust in our circles, maybe we could be talking about some deep stuff. So that's kicking off, right? That's, that's the tier one. And in, 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 a be- in, in like an ideal world, that's happening in every single advisory. If it's a K to eight, it's happening in every single classroom at least once a week. And we're building these deep relationships. Teacher, student, student, student. We got way less harm happening, way less referrals, no suspensions. You know, that's the ideal world. That, that doesn't happen, though. It's happening in a couple schools in Philly. I can think of two schools in Philly that do it really well. Um, then we have this tier two process. This tier two process is very similar to youth court. And so it, 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 it provides, you know, an option. And uh, for courts, they can actually say, like, this is one of the things that, that we can recommend happens. It's a mediation. It's called a harm and healing circle. And so folks circle up. And the goal really is to talk about what happened. What do they need to move forward based on those, need, those needs? What are you willing to do? What are you willing to agree to? And if agreements are reached, this thing's done. No need for punitive and then what happened for us in Oakland is that we, we, we were doing these and the, the, the myth that's out there is that our youth want to be violent. Our youth don't want to be violent. Our youth want to be loved, man. Like they just want to be given love and respect. They don't want to be violent. But what happens in our schools, it, and it happens outside of schools, is that in schools, though, we give kids two options. So an, an example that I use is like, man, I'm in, I'm in the classroom, right? And I got this guy behind me talking mess to me. And a couple of kids are hearing the mess talk. I've already gone to the teacher. The teacher was giving me the worst advice ever. It was like, Josh, man, just like ignore it. It's just words. It's not going to hurt you. But I know like, dude, they're punking me. And they, I'm going to leave here and more people are going to start punking me. And I'm going to walk out of this room and it's going to keep going. And so the second, so the first option is be a punk and say nothing. The second option is get violent, send a message. That's the prison mentality. I'm going to, I'm going to pop you in the face in front of everybody. That way everybody knows they can't punk me. But what if you got a third option? You got the mess talk happening. You don't want to ignore it, but you you don't want to get violent. I got this group of people over here. These RJ people in my school, these youth court people in my school. I can go to them and they're going to help me squash it. Like, and there's no judgment. There's no guilt. There's no shame. There's nothing attached to it. We solve it ourselves in our community. We don't need nobody, no enforcement coming in, nobody coming in saying, you know, this is how you should be. And no, we're going to solve it ourselves and serve. So that's, that's tier two. Tier three, that's for our extra love kids. That's for our kids like me who were suffering so bad. They were hurting so bad that they need more than just a mediation in this one situation. They need some, they need some eldership, man. They need someone to connect up with them. So we use circle of support and accountability. That way, everybody's, all the people are brought to the table to give love to this young person. Mom's there, dad's there, counselor, teacher, admin, and we're all going to share love. We're going to action plan. We're going to build a plan that's restorative. We all got input on it. We're going to create goals together. And everybody in that circle is accountable, not just that young person who's struggling. Mom's accountable. Dad's accountable. Teacher's accountable. Admin to this young person's success. So that's, that's, that's how we're looking at it in the, in the school district. Thank you. And, uh, and and let me let all of you know that we've actually exceeded an hour. Um, I, and it probably hasn't felt like that because um, we were really engaged in, I think, a very important conversation. Um, 
you know, and, and we really had an opportunity to share a lot of things. And, and I want to make sure that people didn't miss them because in what, what was said, there was a lot there. Uh, we did not get to all the questions. So uh, there are questions in the question and answer. We will go back and try to answer them offline uh, through the question and answer, make sure everyone gets their answers. Uh, panelists, please feel free. If you want to take a look and, and answer questions in the, in the question and answer, please go take a look at that. We have some questions such as um, how, um, you know, how, how is foster care connected to this work and, and other things. So please take a moment, go through the question and answer, um, answer some of the questions uh, in your own words uh, back to the panelists so we have that information captured uh, as well. Just before we go, I did want to call out a few things to make sure that uh, the people listening did not miss them. Um, you know, one of the things, the things I heard was empathic listening, right? Or, or I'm sorry, empathetic listening, em em empathetic listening. In, in the sense of sitting back and taking a moment, taking a breath, not trying to just go out and uh, make a problem out of an issue, right? Something I'm dealing with in a moment and create a problem out of it. We heard that as well. Um, I also heard be that one teacher. Not only is you know is it to look at that one teacher, but we can all be that one teacher that someone has to come and you know come to and and to be there to support someone. Um, we heard uh, create an environment of accountability as uh, you know, one of, one of the themes that I've heard. Uh, you know, Kier talked about being introspective, looking at ourselves and how can we, we be different and what, how are we playing a role? Uh, Josh talked about you know, the three tiers within the school district. And I think that we can have, learn a lot and take that outside of the school district and apply that into many other contexts where we're looking at you know, building an environment of peer accountability, such as the youth court, which was defined. Um, and restorative justice, the community building, which we should all be doing. And then the other part of it is creating this circle, right? The, and, and again, in, in the school district, the youth circle, but we can create circles within our own communities to provide support to those who need it most. And so I want to thank our panel um, this after or this morning slash this afternoon. We started in the morning and now we, we're wrapping in the afternoon for sharing yourselves, um, being vulnerable with everyone on this call and really providing direction for how we can solve some of these problems. So now it's um, my responsibility to turn it back to Michelle Lesser for uh, the next steps. Thank you again uh, for an amazing panel uh, this morning and afternoon. Thank you, Atif. Appreciate being oh, proud of it. Thank, Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Uh, talk about power and passion and energy and everything, every word that you could think of to describe this panel. We're so very grateful and for this whole morning. And we want to remind you that you uh, will not want to miss the afternoon, that we'll have another really wonderfully dynamic panel. Um, and more um, insight to really be had and also a town hall. So we don't want you to miss what's coming next. But we will take a break. We certainly have been nourished in mind and spirit.